This week's podcast is sponsored by MPB, the simplest and safest way to sell photo and video kit. Free up funds from your kit bag and get paid fast. Find out how much MPB will pay you at mpb.com forward slash sell. Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for Monday the 25th of April. April's nearly gone. Uh, the movies podcast, it's going to follow us tonight at half past eight. So if you've tuned in for the movies, you're just a little bit early. So why not stick around for the hardware? Because we're going to talk about lots of kit tonight. Uh, but like I say, they are coming along at half past eight to talk about movies. Um, for those of you who are not watching live um, and a little bit later in the week, if you listen to the audio version, it's all one podcast. So the movies guys will be up a little bit later on this podcast. If you can look at the time codes, you can pop around at the podcast as well. And if you're listening a little bit later on and uh, new is AV Forums podcast channel on YouTube. So if you want to see little snippets of the podcast, if there's particular subjects you want to go back and revisit, uh, there will be short videos on the AV Forums podcast uh, YouTube page. Uh, so why not look out for that? Uh, why not subscribe to that? Um, and also there will be the hardware and movies podcasts live streams all put together as one long video so you can also find us on there and of course you can find us through your usual podcast provider in audio only form and once again thank you very much for your support because i've got something to show you that we got through in the post and it's oh. rather funky but there we go that's our it, 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 so it's on the camera there uh, 100,000 subscribers cool. YouTube Ooh, lovely. Uh, plaque, ah. which is very nice. And thank you very much to everybody uh, who supports the channel, who watches our review videos, who comes along to tune in live to the live streams, or if you listen to us audio only. Thank you very much. It really is appreciated. And of course, it's appreciated as well. Those of you who support us as patrons and so on, and details will be coming up if you want to do that a little bit later. But joining me tonight is the usual team. The usual suspects, as we shall say. Ed Sally's here. He's going to talk about hi-fi. Good evening, mm. Ed. Hello, sir. You're right. Yes, good. Thank you very much. Also joining us is news writer Ian Collin. Good evening, Ian. Oh, he's gone quiet. He's he's, so he's on mute. On mute. Yeah. Oh, I keep doing that. I do yeah. that because I think I'm going to cough or sneeze or something, and then I forget to turn it back. <laughs> Rookie mistake. Yeah, there you go. The rookie making mistakes. And also joining us is a display calibration expert uh, here again this evening to talk about how to improve your display and your picture quality and so on. And that's Julian Scott. Jules, evening good all. to see you. And um, just remind us again, uh, if people want to find out a little bit more about you and your background and so on, uh, what's the website they need to, to jump over to to have a look at what you do, Jules? Uh, well, my website is displaycalibration.co.uk. Okay, well, there it's you go. It's easier to say than write. <laughs> so a uh, little plug there for Jules. Go see what he does. Uh, he may be able to sort you out with your display as well. So uh, what have we been up to since the last podcast two weeks ago? Um, Ed, what have you been doing? School holidays. Two oh, words. Oh, you're no, you're no, too I mean, old for school, aren't you? Yeah, well, <laughs> um, no, I, 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 I've been sent back. They're still trying to make me do GCSE math. <laughs> no, um, Easter holidays, um, I don't want to sound hard done to because uh, uh, my son was with her, his mother for most of the first week and I sort of took over duties in the second week. Um, it was good. Uh, we went to a couple of different sort of museums, exhibits and things. The weather was good, so we just bimbled around. I mean, as long as you feed an eight-year-old boy an ice cream on a quasi-regular basis, they will go a surprising distance and visit a surprising number of things um on saturday we went to the bista heritage scramble um which has always got loads of cool things uh lots and lots of uh, random cars um some interesting takes are, i mean essentially because it's quite it's you know it's got a, a reasonably discerning clean tell they've, they've gone sort of one step beyond fairground and festival food vans they're more sort of artisanal and some of them are more successful than others but that was a, a pleasant day out so uh the, the upshot of that is that um i'm now essentially uh, you'll be staggered to hear this because it's so unlike me uh it's just running into the end of the month basically writing a review 
every day. So uh, yeah, that's that's where, where what, what I've been up to. Um, same old, same old, really. Although I will say there's some some, some interesting interesting stuff um, that I've been writing up this week. Uh, one of which we'll be talking later on. But um, there's some other other genuinely interesting things in the pipeline. I uh, I followed you on Twitter. Uh, just remind us of your Twitter handle. Uh, EJ Selly. So my usual uh, spelling of of Selly. Um, S e double l e y. Ed Selly is somebody completely different on Twitter and hasn't posted for many, many years. So if Elon oh. Musk is listening, uh, the new owner of Twitter, if he can get that sorted. I don't know. I've been EJ Selly on things for so long these days. I think it's the one that I'd probably right. stick so with. It's the one that people all know. But anyway, I was following your uh, your car show, your photographs and so on. Some some nice uh, nice bits of metal there. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's well worth it. If you live anywhere near Bista, the Bista Heritage thing, they do events throughout the summer. Um, it's a really nice space for them to do it in. It's, it's really, really good fun. So, yeah, yeah can't recommend it highly well, enough. I, I, uh, I went to a Mustang meet without a Mustang. So, um, obviously, those that don't know, I, I yeah, got rid of the Mark 1. I was offered uh, a large sum of cash. <laughs> Uh, because they're so rare and because of the chip shortage and everything else that's going on at the moment. Um, and it was winter time, so I got rid of mine. So I went to a Mustang meet without a Mustang. Uh, it was interesting. Of course, How did you get there? Uh, I got there in a Kia Diesel. <laughs> <laughs> I do hope they made you park around the corner. Oh, yeah, park around the corner out the way. And uh, I actually arrived there in the passenger seat of a, of a friend's car, so it wasn't too bad. But, um, uh, yeah, that's how it's going to be this year. I'm, I'm busy looking uh, to move house and so on, and uh, the car had to go, unfortunately, so for that to happen. But uh, we'll be getting back in once. If anybody uh, sees a, a 15 to 17 model, it has to be a 5-litre has to destroy the environment and sound uh, noisy and all the rest of it. That's what I want. But, um, but yeah, it was interesting going and not having a car. Uh, also back running again. So um, Well done. I uh, couched a 5K. I was supposed to be doing it this evening instead of a podcast. I'm going to have to do it every other week. Um, but, yeah, I'm building up to getting to park runs and so on and running 5K and all the rest of it. And do I enjoy it? I don't enjoy the getting out and, and doing it. But afterwards, you do feel... <laughs> perversely very very happy with yourself oh, and you feel good after yes. it but it's the uh it's the actual doing it you you go through all the emotions let's just say you think why am i doing this what's wrong with me you know yeah move a bit faster fat boy that kind of thing all running through your head and then you finish and it you feel great so yeah back to running again jules what have you been doing um when i've not been in dark rooms um i have been mostly walking I think some of you guys have been as well. Um, <laughs> nice weather over the weekend, wasn't it? Um, yes. And actually, you know, what was struck me was that the fields are parched. We haven't had a decent amount of rain for a long time. No, 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 it is dry. Um, yeah. But if it mimics what happened last year, um, you're it's already waiting. waiting. It's not particularly uh, warm. Um, yeah. I mean, I remember May the 1st last year was bloody cold. I mean, I remember listening to my heating running on May the 1st last year. Um, and uh, then we had a very wet spate in May. So I don't know, it, 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 uh, much as I don't necessarily enjoy being rained on, it, I agree with you, Jules, that we probably need to do something about it. Um, yeah. So if it's the same as last year, then we just essentially, we have this pleasant, uh, you know, spring-based weather, then it's damp, and then we get sort of summer proper for an intermediate period of time, sort of June, July sort of phase of it. But I wait with bated breath to see what gets sprung this year. Oh. But with a... Decent weekend weather, haven't we? It was very nice. Yeah. And, mm. um, yeah. uh, my daughter, my old, youngest daughter, was back from uni um, for Easter. My oldest daughter was off because she's a teacher. So um, we went out to a National Trust place, and uh, I was all set for a lovely slice mm. of their Victoria sponge cake. But the the sods have put the calorific value of everything on a board in front of you. <laughs> it's like 650 calories for a little slice of Victoria sponge cake. Yeah. It's like, ah, I had to settle on the chocolate brownie for 400. <laughs> Just yeah. ignore it. But yeah. I mean, you know, it. I, I, I have, you know, as a conversation for another time, I have grave reservations about it. It has different effects for different people that, and I don't think it's been very well thought through, but I, I, I just, as essentially, all I do, George, is just take my glasses off. Then I can <laughs> read the calorific value um, and it's fine. So um, it works perfectly. Yep, good stuff. Uh, right, so that means we just need to pass over to Ian and find out what you've been up to. Um, well, you'd be shocked to hear it involves gaming. <laughs> yeah. um, this, the, the past couple of weeks, I've been playing an awful lot of Minecraft, um, which some of you might be familiar with. 
Um, it's part of a, a side project that I've got going on. I had to kind of dive back into. I haven't played it for quite a while. So I had to basically start from scratch. So going through all the, the stuff that I'd gone through before, but this time I had to make an effort to kind of learn a lot of the stuff I hadn't played before, I hadn't learned before, and also get to grips with all the stuff that's new since I last played it. And it's kind of, it's given me kind of a, a fresh appreciation for just the sheer scale of what you can do in the game, because it can be a very simple game of just digging holes and building things with blocks. It's it's basic, it's simple, kids can play it. But the complexity when you really dive into it, it's it still manages to surprise and amaze me even now. Like one thing, it's a relatively simple design, but I managed to make a, a rubbish bin, like an automated rubbish bin. So you put your stuff you don't need into this little chest at the top and it drops through a couple of items. And then like an electric circuit runs around and then it fires it out into a lava pit. So it's gone for good. So you never have to throw stuff away. And it was just little things like that. I've kind of been able to put together. Is this in the sort of creator rather than the survival mode thing? Um, Both. I was doing it in survival mode. Obviously, it's a lot easier in the creative mode where you have Mm. everything's open to you. But survival mode, you've got to go find it, mine it, craft it yourself. So Mm. It just takes a lot longer, but that makes it feel a bit more satisfying. A bit more. My, my son was trying to explain it to me, and I just went cross-eyed after about fifteen minutes. Um, it, it the, the 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 but I, I agree with you. Some what some I mean, people have built sort of working computers in yeah. in the creation wow. mode. It's just bonkers. So yeah. you know, yeah, um, I'm impressed. Uh, and it sounds. I mean, it's it's vaguely wholesome. Um, you yeah. Know, so yeah, that's, that's all good too. Nobody dies. Well, sometimes well, they do. Yeah, do they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, okay. For a game the same yeah. to kids, like a lot of the early stuff involves killing animals for food. So it's not exactly <laughs> entirely wholesome. But yeah, it's still, yeah, it's cute, fluffy. Kids can play it because, like I say, it's, it's, it's in its simplest form, it's very basic. But yeah, you can get deep into it and get lost forever. Okay, well, that's uh, that's what the team has been up to uh, this past couple of weeks. Uh, we're going to get on with the show and we're going to do hardware next. <laughs> If you'd like to support the AV Forums podcast on a regular basis, then why not become a patron? Head over to patreon.com forward slash AV Forums to sign up. You can also make a one-off donation through the Super Chat or via streamlabs.com forward slash AV Forums. All donations help us to improve the website and the podcasts. Thank you to all our supporters. Okay, do you fancy winning something? You're going to have to be quick on one of these competitions because it ends tomorrow, but Ian's going to tell us all about the stuff that you can win hardware-wise. Yeah, like you say, there's two competitions up and running. Uh, first of all, you can win a Valencia single Tuscany Black Cinema seat, which is worth a bump of £1,399. So that's definitely something worth having. Very nice. And the competition that's uh, closing on the 26th of April. So if you're watching this live, you've got a day to get in it. If you're watching it, the recorded version, you might have missed out. But it's a chance to win an Atlas EOS Modular 4.0 power conditioning block worth £900. That one's courtesy of our friends at Yorkshire AV. Um, so if you're quick enough, you want to get into that second one, or if you want to win that Black Cinema seat, head over to avforums.com slash competitions to get your entries in. All competitions are open to eligible AV Forums members that are resident in the UK, and that discounts all of us. Excellent. No, 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 believe it or not, it's... Uh, it's um... Phil, no, it's, just, it's just me. Phil. It's, you guys I mean, can enter. All this yeah. time it would be it. suspicious though if we did win. <laughs> it would, but you know, there's nothing stopping you in the rules. Oh, I didn't know that. that. As long as you're resident in the UK and not some far Get yourself a big cherry and go on. Okay. Yeah, there I'm you go. Um, there should be previous competition winners. Uh, obviously, this doesn't pop up in the same way as the movies, so we will get some previous competition winners announcements for you for the next podcast. Uh, we will look into that and we'll tell you what people have been winning because we've had a few close in the last couple of weeks, so we'll get on to that. Um, again, the chat window is open if you're watching live this evening. Um, if you're not watching live and you want to ask questions, you are more than welcome to do that. You can do that via podcast at avforums.com email um, or drop a question into the chat forum, uh, AV Forums podcast chat forum. You go onto the forums list, go all the way down to the bottom of the forums and you'll find the podcast forum. Then just find the episode uh, and leave your question there and we'll get back to you with an answer hopefully a little bit later but like i say if you're watching us live thank you very much for doing that there's quite a few of you out there tonight and uh, please do hit that like button it is important uh, it helps us get found and bring more people into our cult uh, so please help with that if you don't mind 
And of course, if you want to pop around all the time and see the podcasts as they happen, as well as TV reviews and TV settings videos and all that kind of thing, why not hit the subscribe button? It would be appreciated. So get your questions in. We'll come back to those a little bit later in the podcast. Um, see, there's a lot of TV stuff coming in. That's great. We will get to that. Um, and I'm going to talk about TV in a little bit, but we're going to do AV news first. Uh, then we're going to do hi-fi news. Um, we'll then pop over and I'll talk about the LG C2, which is a TV I've been living with at the moment. Ed's going to talk about some mission speakers that have come in for review. The review's not quite ready yet, but he's going to give us a preview of what he thinks. He's been living with these things for a little while. And then we're going to go over to Jules, who's going to give us another lesson in calibration. How can we improve our TV's picture performance? And we're talking about the room tonight so uh, stay tuned for that and of course we've got ed's album vinyl and playlist to round us off so first of all let's go over to ian for av news so uh, what's been hitting the news pages this week um well primarily probably start with tcl uh unveiling their latest collection of tvs for 2022 uh there's four models in total making up a new c series two of which mini led tvs and two qled tvs in there Plus, they've also announced three soundbars, so they've obviously been pretty busy of late. Um, all of the key information is up on the website, so I won't go through everything on these. Uh, but the short version is the two mini LEDs come in sizes from 55 to 75 inches, whereas the QLED start at 43 and go up to a pretty sizable 98 inch model. So that's basically a window. Uh, amongst the upgrades, TCL are promising the usual suspects really higher brightness, better contrasts. Uh, and most of the TVs also come with some very gamer-friendly features, so there's some very interesting choices in there. Um, as for the soundbars, they all look pretty good as well, led by the C935U, which is a 5.1.2 Dolby Atmos soundbar with a wireless sub built in, which, unsurprisingly, they're billing as being the perfect companion to their TVs. Um, no price given for anything as yet, and we're told to expect everything by the second half of 2022. Okay. Um... TCL still trying to uh, make the mark in the UK market. They're, they've been two or three years now, maybe a bit longer than that, actually, because uh, lockdown and what's happened the last couple of years kind of skews your, when you're trying to remember back to how things used to be. But it's probably about four or five years, if I'm being honest. Uh, still haven't really got a grip. And I think the thing, certainly with AV Forum's audience, is the fact that we don't tend to get the models that, uh, are launched in the states so it's going to be interesting and it's not just tcl hisense do the same thing they they launch the the much better spec uh, models to the larger market in the us and 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 we don't get those models and obviously there's a business case for that but you know we've pushed them a few times both companies to look at bringing their tvs into the uk so uh, it'll be interesting to see how they perform it'll also be interesting to see if they put them forward for review because again getting these uh, tvs in for review um, hasn't been easy up till now um so we'll wait and see if our request for review samples and so on and, and the higher end models is what we're interested in um We'll see if we can get those in. So that's TCL. Any other TV news, Ian? Yeah, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right. It's the Lerva Build CTVs. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, these are a couple of two new compact edge sled TVs. Um, done with Dolby Atmos and Dolby Vision, but they're sort of small, compact, and supposedly sophisticated TVs coming in a 4K 43-inch model and a 2K Full HD 32-inch version. So they're kind of... Designs kind of look good within kind of a modern home, but these are kind of relatively small screen sizes compared mm. to the usual suspects. But they still come in with relatively lofty price tags, yeah, uh, coming at uh, fifteen hundred pounds and thirteen hundred pounds respectively. So it'll be considering you can buy considerably larger TVs for a similar price. It'll kind of be interesting to see whether they've got the substance to match the style. Really, yeah. it's uh, it's very much a designer. TV, very much design led, um, and they always have been. Uh, Larva, they, they've always produced beautiful looking products uh, and well built and well engineered products. Um, they have gone out of business a couple of times, so they, I think this will be the third reincarnation of third the, time the, lucky. the brand. So, yeah, third time lucky. Um, and it's interesting that they're starting with small screen sizes this time around. Uh, they obviously they think that there is a luxury specialist market there, so. Uh, again, it'll be interesting to see how, how they take to the market. And uh, Jules, any Larva customers out there who have had their TVs calibrated? Really, to be honest. I mean, I haven't yeah. done it a few years back, yeah. Um, but um, no, I don't really. It's the usual suspects, isn't it? And for me, it's Panasonic, LG, Sony, 
those are the main three brands that I, I come across. Samsung yeah. as well, um, but Lerva, not very often, I have to say. Yeah, it's a it's a completely different market. It's uh, you know like your Waitrose supermarkets and that kind. Of, it's a it's a different demographic that they're going for. They're going for a luxury. It's a luxury item. So, um, and again, I keep saying it'll be interesting, but it will to see how they get on. Right, let's move it on. Let's talk some audio. First of all, AV audio, a uh, new soundbar from Denon. Yeah, yeah. This one comes in uh, at what we call the well the more affordable end of the spectrum with the. DHT S217 price is just £250. Uh, but still coming with Dolby Atmos 3D and built in subwoofers. So chances are it's not going to match up to some of the, the pricier options in the Denon range, such as the Home 550 soundbar we covered more recently. But it's just a nice, affordable option that comes with you know all the, the kind of the key features that you're looking for within that kind of price range. Uh, fit under most good sized TVs. So it just looks like a, a nice addition to the family that offers something a little bit different that the range hasn't perhaps covered uh, in the recent past. So it's, again, it could be interesting how it kind of fits in with the rest of the models that are out there. Yep. Yeah, um, and we should have a review coming up with that soon. Uh, you may have noticed that we do have a new uh, reviewer for Home AV products, uh, John Archer. John's been around a very, very, very long time. Um, in the industry, he's agreed to come and uh, review soundbars and uh, other uh, home AV products for us AV forums. So his first review is on the homepage at the moment. It's a Samsung soundbar. Uh, if you want to go and uh, find out a bit more, then go and read that. It's on the homepage right now. I think it's the Q990B. Um, so go Such and have a snappy, a that. snappy model know. names, isn't yeah. it? You know. Yeah, it's gone from A last year to B this year. It's uh, yeah. I mean, to be fair, that does give them plenty of time before they have to think of doing anything different, doesn't it? So, you know, there's some commendable future proofing going on. Yeah, there. I mean, if manufacturers are listening, can can you make sure that if you have a model number, it is worldwide, the model number? Um, it makes it so much easier because uh -huh. we're we're living in a global uh, economy these days, and um, with the internet and everything else. I mean, I, we have a huge audience not just uk even though we're uk based from all over the world and when you're discussing products and they have different uh, names and, and different model numbers and all the rest of it for the same products it gets confusing very quickly so please manufacturers one model number for the entire world market would be ideal um, mm. we might even talk about your products even more if uh, if we can do that right um let's move on to some hi-fi then just to round up on the news this week uh, so ian what's happening hi-fi why um yeah starting off with some uh, some speakers on the last podcast we mentioned the eclipse retiring its classic uh, td 712z speaker uh, without having a replacement ready for it but there's no such issues this time around with the td 307 loudspeaker which is getting an instant upgrade from the mark ii to the mark iii version um, I mean, I could go on, but I think Ed had a review up for this within like seconds of me finishing the news story. So I don't know if well, yeah, I mean, they, they were delivered nice and early, and I spent some meaningful time with them. Uh, the review is up to read. I'm not going to go all the way through it. Um, if you accept that this is really competition for open-backed headphones, um, and in that regard, it used near field, they are utterly sublime. Use them like a normal speaker, and they're not. <laughs> <laughs> it's as simple as that, basically. If you look at the thing, oh, that could just be a really elegant way of boosting the size of my TV. No, 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 no. They must be less than a meter away from you. You need to pay attention to the setup instructions that Eclipse give. Do that, and they can do things that very little else anywhere near the price can do. But um, as I said in the review, they don't have a performance envelope. They have a performance sachet. You have to use them in the manner to which Eclipse intends you to do so. But uh, I have really high hope. If this is the start point for how they're going to start revisiting other models in the range, I absolutely cannot wait to have a look at them. Yeah, and as I said, uh, the review's up there. Go have a read. Um, and what else have we got? Oh, turntables. Because mm. it's record store day, or has it been it, record store it's day? Been, oh, record it. store day has been um, All right. uh, not the time for I mean, it's essentially, it was another... I don't think we've had a vintage clutch of record store day records for a couple of years now, but I, I do. Obviously, there's been a huge amount of disruption. Full stop. But um, no, it happened, and I hope that people that participated in it picked up what they wanted and 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 had a good time. But no, there has been a load of turntables at the same time. Um, uh, this is an interesting one. The Alva TTV two. Um, uh, I suppose I can admit this now. I was I, I helped test this and make sure that some of the more invigorating bells and whistles work as they're supposed to. 
so the Alva was released a couple of years ago. It's uh, a direct drive. It is a direct drive lifestyle turntable. So it's a fairly unique. So I hate quantifying unique. It is a unique sort of niche in things. It's not. It's not going after you know Technics SL twelve hundreds. It is an extremely pitch stable, extremely capable turntable. But then it's equipped with a phono stage on board, which now thankfully you can switch out if you don't want to use it. Um, and it has a really nice Bluetooth implementation. So if you do want to Bluetooth the sound to a different room at the same time, you can. And whilst I've pointed this out in reviews in the past that. Uh, the number of people that will actually do this, you can count on the fingers of one knee. Um, it does actually work really well, if that's what you fancy. So um, that's what Cambridge is up to. Um, and I, I have every confidence that's going to be a nice product. It also really helps that um, the cartridge that comes supplied with that is an absolute gem. The Alva uh, Moving Core cartridge is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, actually well worth seeking out on its own. Then... Um, uh, on a more sort of hardcore, I say hardcore, project um, who released new turntables on a very rapid basis. I mean, I could realistically um, turn over half my allotted reviews each year to just reviewing new things from project. <laughs> but uh, I don't because, I, you know, I don't want to get sacked. But um, that uh, this time round, they have gone for um, a turntable and a phono stage. Um, two phono stages even, um, where the main selling point is that this is completely balanced um, from the pick, you know, the wires going into the back of the cartridge all the way to the XLR outs on the phono stage. Now, this is, um, you know, we get, uh, we, we've had arguments, we've discussed balanced components in the past, uh, and there's information about it on the forums. I would argue that turntables over and above digital are something that do genuinely benefit from being used in the balanced configuration. It can really, really drop the noise floor on them. So this is a quasi affordable way of, of doing just that if you go all in with the uh, project hardware. Um, I'm hopefully going to have a look at these um and because as i say there's an interesting technical angle and i do suspect they are going to be rather good um so hopefully there'll be a review on them but in the meantime if you are looking for both a turntable and a phono stage and you have a system which is able to run balanced this could be it could have a significant advantage over a lot of the competition simply because it's been designed to be balanced from the start so this is a nice piece of thinking from project and yeah i'm I, i'm guardedly optimistic that there'll be a, a a welcome new arrival excellent well lots of turntable news there if that's mm. your thing and and it has been my thing recently i uh still waiting to find out if i can get my hands on a sl 1200 in green but we'll green. see and if i if i do you'll be the first to know excellent. right let's move on we're going to talk about some kit now and then we're going to move on to jules to talk about uh, the room in which your kit sits and how to make sure it's perfect especially for your display uh, but first of all uh, the tv that is sat behind me right now that is 65 inch lg c2 uh, we purchased this so this is a retail sample it was purchased from a high street retailer um reason for that is uh review samples can be limited in numbers and you can be on a list and wait a while for a tv to come through uh, but the other thing is that we like to dip into the market now again and just check that um you know there's no golden samples and and there hasn't been any golden samples for a number of years now because uh, most reviewers worth the salt do measure do take uh, a great deal of attention uh, to the picture quality and so on and a lot of uh, people who write technical reviews are also calibrators uh, like ourselves here uh, so we do get to see things in the wild as well especially Jules uh, gets to see things in the wild as well and we can usually tell um, if there, there was something like a golden sample so um, that's why we went out and bought one the other reason is this is going to stick around for a while. It's probably going to stick around until the C3 comes out because I have no doubt that that'll be one of the comparisons that we do uh, in the future. So have I measured this? No. Have I calibrated it yet? Nope. I've lived with it for a week. Um, just out of the box settings, set it up with WebOS uh, on my network, made sure all the apps are up to date, um, made sure they're all working. And uh, we basically used it as a living room TV for a week um, just to see how it beds in because it's no point measuring it and uh, and doing all your testing brand new out of the box you got to let these things run in a little bit especially with it being a retail sample that hadn't been used before i had the pleasure of taking the film off the front of the screen 
Um, mm. It's nice on a mobile phone when it's a 65 inch screen. It's oh, so nice when you just take that off there. Um, so, yeah, uh, brand new out of the box. There is a video up there of me unpacking uh, the TV and showing you what, what's what in there. Uh, new stand, which is really nice. Um, it is incredibly light this year. Um, if you have a C1 from last year, uh, compared to that, it is really light. It's because they're using new composite uh, materials uh, to build the thing. The stand's made of the same materials. It's, it's really light. Uh, but once you screw it all together, and it's really dead simple to screw it all together and get up and running, um, really sturdy, really nice. Um, it, it's, it's, it is a step up from the C1. And again, I haven't done any uh, measurements with it. it. hasn't been calibrated. It's just been running it in filmmaker mode. And I can tell straight away there is a big improvement over the C1. The main big improvement is not in the highlights. It's what we discussed last time on the podcast. It's what's happening in the shadows. And that is the LG have managed to get the new Gen 5 Alpha 9 processor able to get out of black properly without dither, without uh, you know using too much uh, black crush to cover up uh, any flashing or whatever. It comes out of black properly. Now, there is bags of shadow detail on show as it should be. Um, in the lower reaches of the picture. So there's no crushed blacks going on. This is with uh, SDR and HDR content. It looks phenomenal uh, in that respect. You know, uh, and, and I'm, I'm sure Jules will have uh, some comments with this as well, but it has been an Achilles heel for OLED technologies cut coming out of black, yep, Jules. Yep, yeah, um, obviously OLED is famous for its zero black level. Um, but they've always struggled to get out of black. Um, it's like couch to 5K, isn't it? So it's getting off the couch. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's been, an, it's a, been a, a, an annual problem and an annual uh, test to see, you know, is this year's better than last year's? Uh, because as we said before, um, you know, our eyes are tuned to see shadow detail. Um, Evolutionary-wise, that's what we see better. Yep. Um, so for OLED not to be able to... Uh, uh, you know, do, do that as well as it, as we'd like um, has been a bit of a bit of a, a thorn in the side of the technology. So it's great to hear that you know that they've they've managed to improve on it this year. Uh, as a C1 owner, a bit pissed, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it, there's no such thing as the perfect display. And I'm going to come on to it no. in a minute because I've been reading the 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 chat that's going on at the moment, um, the live chat with the video, and a um, lot of hype about QD OLED at the minute. And I'm sure QD OLED has its plus points. It's also going to have its negative points. So people who are saying that, uh, you know, WRGB OLED is dead and LG OLED is dead, and that's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. LCD is still around. And yeah. LCD is still doing a great job um, because there's investment still in that. And, it, and it's, it matches people's requirements. And I think this is something we really need to get across. And um, it it's it's a different technology. There are different technologies to do slightly different things, and one technology is going to suit one person better than another technology. Um, there is no perfect TV. Uh, I am sure QD OLED is going to do really well. Um, it should do with the amount of hype uh, at the minute. I have no doubt that there are certain manufacturers are pushing that. Uh, hype on the internet uh, because it seems to be everywhere at the moment um, yet we can't get these things in our hands over here unfortunately uh, just yet the Samsung is is pretty rare and the Sony's not going to be around for at least another uh, month or so uh, probably a little bit longer than that um, now I have seen the Sony I've seen QD OLED uh, I've seen it with their processing I've seen the, the demonstrations that a lot of other uh, journalists uh, saw earlier in the year it is impressive but again it's not perfect um, so I think we need to rein in the over the top, uh, let's hype. hit the brakes on the hype train guys. Yeah. Let's just see how things actually pan out. Once we can live with, uh, the technology for a little while, once we can put it up head to head with existing technology, anybody that comes in and, and I don't mean to be disrespectful to the guy who put the comments in that LG OLED is dead, but that that's not helpful to anybody yeah, and that's not true um it, it's you know there is a place for each of these technologies uh, there's going to be price points for each of these technologies um that you're going to see improvements we've seen improvements this year and this was a point i was getting across you know, with the c2 compared to the c1 
there are improvements here. Uh, they have been listening to feedback uh, and they have been improving the technology as it goes along. And I've no doubt that the same will be true uh, with QD OLED. I just think it's getting overhyped at the minute and we just need to rein it in just a tiny wee bit. Joe. Yeah, and, some, and get some really good technical reviews done. Yeah. yeah. And that's, yeah. that's where we need to nail in on that. And I'd be very interested to what you have to say, Phil, because you'll probably get one before I see one in the, in the wild. And the other thing we'll be quite interested is, you know, see how Samsung and Sony both handle that technology, having um, battled this past week with a, a Samsung, um, you know, with its color management system, which I have to say, Samsung used to be very, very good, very effective CMS, but over mm. the years, I don't find them, you know, that they've declined no. in, in, in efficacy. So you can yeah. really struggle with them. So I, I really do hope that with this new tech that Samsung can improve on the, on the color accuracy. Uh, particularly with those calibration controls. Yeah. Uh, and also yeah. when it comes to the EOTF and HDR as well, because they've had a problem in the past with over-brightening. Um, mm -hmm. that, but, um, and Sony, on the other hand, they've got an excellent reputation for color accuracy. So I'm, I'm fascinated to see how both those companies will handle this new tech. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's no doubt you know, it has a value that wouldn't be coming to market. If it didn't have a value, I have seen the Sony. It's very impressive. Um, but again, we, you're, you're only getting one side of the, the story at the moment. Uh, we will get technical reviews starting to come in. We'll get our hands on them as soon as we can uh, to start doing that. And hopefully the hype will have died by then because at the minute you're just looking at YouTubers trying to get uh, views to their channels, which is what YouTubers do. Um, you know, they go to far lengths to hype things up to get viewing numbers. And once that dies off, uh, we'll start to get the real story. Um, we'll start to find out exactly what this technology is capable of and, and how it uh, manages. And like we said in the last podcast, uh, LG screens are used in a professional environment. They are used uh -huh. to check uh, color grades and all the rest of it. Um, if it was a dead technology, if it was a bad technology, it wouldn't be getting used for that. So, yeah, let's rein in the hype a little bit. And stay tuned for the C2 uh, review. Um that is coming up very soon. It is a very impressive TV. It's going to be a big seller because it's at the sweet spot. It always has been the C, uh, the C series has always been LG's sweet spot. It does everything incredibly well. If you're a gamer, it is an absolute uh, beast of a TV. It has everything on there. It does do 4K 120 full res and, and all the rest of it. So, um, yeah, it is a cracking TV. I'm going to get on to testing it this week. There will be a settings video going up. Uh, this week as well um, and then we'll get the full round to the full review uh, probably next week because I don't like to just take these things out and uh, and give you a verdict straight away we like to actually test them and, and review them. them um yeah and uh, that takes a little bit of time so anyway uh, that's the LG C2 uh, like I say a review coming up soon and there's another review coming up soon on a product that Ed's going to talk about. And I know Ed's been really excited about this because it's been all over his his Twitter feed and I'll be seeing the photographs and I even got my own photograph sent to me on an internal chat as well because I think you were dead chuffed when this uh, set of speakers turned this up. This is the new, and I use the word new in the sense that the product is newly arrived, but it's the Mission 770, which is a... Um, a faithful recreation of the first mission speaker ever launched, also called the 770. Um, and it shares no parts in common with the original. Um, and essentially, I just wanted to do a very quick preview on this one because it's been a fascinating experience. One, going back to what I said earlier on, um, I've had longer with these just running than is normally the case because last week I didn't do any, any reviewing at all. So they were just in, they were used for everything. Um, so the end result is I wrote the AV Forums review today, um, 2,800 words of it. Um, uh, and part of the reason for that is uh, they ha this is, uh, every now and again I have to do this, this is a, a review which has two conclusions. Um, it has a conclusion which is me putting my sober trousers on and objectively measuring them. Oh. Uh, you know, making a judgment call against other speakers we've, we've reviewed at the price point. And then there's another conclusion which is what I, me, ed think about them um but there are just a couple of just a couple of things i wanted to cover um some of the comments when the news story went up uh this genuinely is a um uh you know it's a three and a half thousand pound loudspeaker it's not inconsequentially expensive but having now spent some time with it it's absolutely competitive with anything being built 
in Europe at the price. It is beautifully assembled. Mission hasn't hasn't um, you know they're not they're not swinging you out of anything. And the fact it comes with a, a proper pair of stands, which otherwise would be a bit of a challenge to get because it's a weird old shape. It's a really nicely thought out product. Um, and I'm going to go light on the sound details because that's all going to be in the review. I just wanted to say um, this is an example. Uh, where we, we, you know, it, it, with the television reviews, as you've just been discussing, there's an element of the absolute. You you run the program and you can make a judgment call on this. Two Channel has always been a bit more of a luxury good in this regard. Um, and one of the things it has to do is make you happy. I will say, I don't think it counts as much of a spoiler because I think you probably guessed it anyway, as a device to make me happy, I haven't tested anything under £5,000 that is just more covetable day-to-day than these loudspeakers. Other than the fact that they're enormous, and I already have many, many pairs of loudspeakers, um, I'd have a pair instantly. Um, So make of that what you will. The full review will be uh, ready to go for Phil at the weekend. You can put it up at any time, I believe. I need to check exactly because it's possible that there's... um, I know that another magazine has a print exclusive. I need to check that there's no web exclusive terms and we can go when we go. Um, But yes, uh, it's been a genuinely enjoyable experience and uh, I hope you enjoy reading it half as much as I've enjoyed writing it and doing the testing for it. Well, you know, 2,800 words, that's a lot for you, Ed, and that's... Well, uh, to be honest, You, you yes, must have liked them, so... There, there, there's a, there was some, in, some technology to cover, but as I say, when you write two separate conclusions, that tends to, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Tends to boost the word count somewhat, so... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. But, well, I'm looking forward to uh, to reading that once it's uh, once it comes through, so we'll, we'll look forward to that one. So let's move on to our subject uh, for tonight, um, and we're going back to TV, we're going back to... Uh, picture quality uh, because we've got Jules on the podcast now uh, for those of you who don't know Jules Jules is a professional calibrator yeah he not only calibrates uh, consumer TVs he's also uh, in studios uh, professional environments and calibrates uh, professional grading monitors as well as uh, the domestic side of things so uh, a real mix of uh, work that you have there Jules and obviously there's a whole audio side that we'll get onto at some point in the future but let's stick to displays so um you go into grading suites uh-huh. uh, yep. where the professionals work, where uh, you know all this work gets done in yep. terms of making sure the colours are correct and that uh, they pull the shadows that you're supposed to see and hide uh-huh. things that you're not supposed to see and so on. But these are done in professional environments, Jules, yep. which is normally uh, pretty dim. And yep. you know, maybe us, we maybe have uh, viewing rooms where that would be the case. You can see the room behind me where I test the majority of TVs, it's a normal living room, white walls and, and so on. We don't all live in grading suites. So what are we missing out on and how do we make sure that we're still getting the full experience from our display? Yeah, well, obviously, um, reference content is made in reference rooms. Uh, if you go into a grading suite, as you say, it's dark, very dark. In fact, standards organisations like Simpty actually have a specification for the ambient, the, the amount of ambient light should have or, you know, in that room, you know, five minutes. Um, then it's dark decor. It's certainly neutral decor, so there's no red walls or anything like that. It's um, everything is done in that room to make sure that nothing is is interdicting with you with the ability of the colorist, the grader, to see the content uh, exactly as it should be seen. And the standards, obviously, for SDR. Um, when you calibrate when when, when you're calibrating those displays, your hundred nits peak output. Uh, 2.4 gamma, uh, also for bias lighting as well. If you go into a grading studio, there will be a bias light behind the TV, and it's not it's a TV but behind the monitor, and it's not it's not funky disco lights or anything like that. You know, um, it is D65 uh, calibrated uh, light at uh, uh, five nits maximum. It used to be 10% of peak brightness. Some people still argue that's probably a better option, but it's it's now fixed five nits behind the on the bias light. And if you want to see the content in your home as accurately as possible, you're going to do what you can to replicate that environment. Um, so, again, switch, you know, putting the lights down, uh, making sure that um, uh, there's no sort of reflections. You know, some people can do that, some people can't. You know, I've got a, I'm lucky to have a, uh, a demo room, my room where it's um, it's all black fabric walls and everything. There's no, there's nothing like that. My living room's completely different. 
um, you know, that's where my wife rules. <laughs> so unfortunately, I can't. I can't do things like that. In that, that's white. That's white walls. Like most of the living rooms I go into to to calibrate. And um, so, yeah, uh, do what you can to lower those light levels, um, particularly with HDR. And the reason is because uh, what you can do with SDR, because it's graded to 100 nits and you've got TVs that are capable of a hell of a lot more output than that, is that you can actually increase the light output. So you can go from 100 nits to 150 nits, um, depending upon the amount of ambient light in the room. The other thing that you would probably do in terms of calibrating if there's significant ambient light is, again, you'd adjust the gamma output. So although the reference gamma is 2.4, you might want to drop in, in a you know to 2.3, 2.2 for a, a brighter room. Um, because that's going to elevate uh, the shadow detail that are otherwise going to be um, you know, occluded by, by the ambient light in the room. Uh, so there's things you can do for SDR to adjust for a non-reference environment. But HDR, you can't really, because um, there's no way that most TVs are already flat out, foot to the floor, and they still can't get to 1,000 nits that the content's been graded to. So where can you go? It's not as if you can increase it. So I see a lot of people on forums complaining that the HDR is too dark. And the answer is your room's too bright. And particularly what we said last week, Phil, about shadow detail and how we see, uh, you know, we, we always bang on about peak output, don't we, on, on, on displays for HDR. But in fact, the shadow detail is just, as, if not more important to see. And if you've got too much ambient light in the room, you won't be able to see it. And unlike with STR, there's nowhere we can go. So for HDR, it really is important to do what you can to um, create more of a reference environment. But SDR, we've got things we can do, but HDR, we're a bit stuck. Mm. It's it's one of those problems, isn't it, that, that um, there's some of us who nitpick and we get our rooms right and we get the, the right color of gray on the walls and so on. And believe me, I have a pot of paint sitting to yeah. do the room next door, the cinema room, in the right grading sweet gray and it it does exist you can find the color out there you can find the code and you can go and get the paint mixed and so there's there's those of us who I, i'd imagine a large number of AV forums members are the same um and want to go for that with the viewing environments but like you say the vast majority of people um you're going to have a room like i'm sitting in at the moment with white walls and, and so on and that's where we're going to run into problems going forward, like you say, with HDR and so on, where, you know, how do you balance out the picture with the room and, and make sure that you're still seeing content the way it's supposed to be seen? Now, some of the technologies out there, Jules, have tried to get around this and combat this. And I'm thinking about Dolby Vision yeah. IQ. IQ. And yep. filmmaker mode on Panasonic TVs that use the, yep. the light sensor as well. Now, this is new technology. This is not, um, a light sensor that you would find on a TV from a couple of years ago, which just elevated the, you know, the the greys and the blacks, and just made things look that little bit brighter in a, in a bright mm -hmm. room. Um, this actually uses the light sensor, but it also uh, uses the metadata that's within the content to try and keep the color volume correct, to try and keep uh, the saturation right, to try and keep uh, white balance correct, but also add that extra boost in brightness to combat the, the viewing conditions. Is that the right way to head uh, to try and get around these issues? Oh, uh, that's, a, that's a difficult one, Phil. Um, you know, I'd always pr prefer, if I could, to control my environment first. But I guess, you know, look, if something's too dim to see, it's too dim to see, you know, and if it helps you see the content and it's, and it, you know, it, then, then I suppose it is, a route to go. Um, I'm always, you know, we're we're all a little bit OCD and anal about these things. I'm always keen to control the environment as much as I can first. But I guess you know, it's if it's a case of seeing something or not seeing something, then 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 yeah, I mean, it is an option. But um, you have to deliberately break the um, EOTF in order to do that, which kind of feels as a calibrator. It feels feels like you know you're breaking the law. Um, but you know, you gotta. You, you, you want to. If you can't see it, then what's the point? Yeah. So, 
it's all about enjoying the TV programs, the movies that we like. Um, and if it's it's too dark, you've got to do something. I suppose it maybe I don't know where this is about you know dialogue in movies, you know, where people complain they can't hear the the you know the dialogue anymore. Mm. Yeah. You know. Well, yeah. I mean, to be fair, there's there's much. I mean, don't get the film don't get the film team started on this. I mean, there's as much an argument that um, directors now shun boom mics. So, I mean, that the, essentially whoever's the people mixing it, they aren't doing anything different. They're oh. just working with more and more shonky distance mic work uh, and then just randomly you get television series which is just incomprehensibly badly done so um you know there's all sorts of all sorts of pulls in that one but you you're right yeah you end up often with with uh sense speaker settings which are significantly yeah. adrift of what the notional yeah. optimum would be and, and, we, and, and in terms of the visual side of things as well, I mean, you know, you, you have to break the EQ, the, the OTF in order to um, in order to to do that, um, where a room is is you know too bright for the content. Um, so that they're, they're they're fine and trying to find solutions for this, aren't they? Um, but um, I'd, I'd always go with the the preference of if you can do what you can to control your environment because yeah. you want to see reference environment. As, as best as possible. Yeah. And of course, there are ways now, uh, like I was just saying uh, and alluding to, the paint colours. Um, yep. There are nice paints out there which can work, that can lower the light level in a room, still look uh, nice for the partner or, or whoever um, you are sharing your environment with. Um, and it keeps everybody happy, but you can also get or extract more performance out of uh, out of your display by just approaching things like that, like we've discussed in the past, Ed, with audio and so on. You know, mm. correct placement of absorption material and so on, uh -huh. and it doesn't need to be, you know, uh, the blocks that I've got on the wall behind me here. You know, proper sound absorbent blocks. You can make them look really nice, and, and no, yeah, the, the, with, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be a brutal studio like environment it can no. be it's amazing what you can get done within the realms of of, of taste and decency wow. which is a catch all phrase really isn't it but um yeah. nevertheless it is true you know there's um there's there's plenty you can do uh, and there's also if you go onto the forums there's plenty of people that have done various permutations of it generally speaking um, it's probably fair to say in the overall lifespan of AB forums that you are not going to be trying something which hasn't been tried before. There will be data on it, and you can normally see how good or bad an idea it is before you crack on with it. And that's just where I was going. It's almost like you've read my mind, Ed. Well, um, mm. We have forums here. We have DIY forums, home cinema DIY forums and so on. Um, you know, Our members invented the media wall. You know, this media wall that all these DIY companies are now offering you, uh, you know, they'll come and build around your chimney with your monitor. And Our guys were doing that decades ago uh, with lighting and all the rest of it. So if you want ideas on how to, you know, make your room a little bit more suited to uh, a, a little bit more like a media room where you can control the colours a little bit in terms of wall colour and so on, get the light levels down so you can enjoy your displays and, and of course the audio side as well you can do it all and um, then head over to the diy forums there's lots of projects in there there's lots of things that forum members have done over the 20 odd years that we've been around uh, on av forums and uh, like ed says uh, somebody will have tried it if you've thought of it somebody will have tried it on av forums there will be a thread about it somewhere uh, with feedback and ideas and so on and it's a great resource. It's where I found the uh, the paint code for the paint that I'm going to put in the uh, in the main media room that I'm building next door to shoot our videos and so on. Um, you can go do this stuff. You can go into your local Dulux or whatever and give them the code, and they'll mix the paint for you. It's is it great? <laughs> is it great, Phil? It is great. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, grey's in fashion, isn't it? It is. Actually, that's what I was saying. You know, it, it, it very much so in fashion yeah. at the minute. Um, and you get you can get the right shade. Um, which doesn't need, need to be really black, but grey does uh -huh. soak the light. It will take the light uh -huh. out of the room and, and help with things. So there's lots of advice on AV forums. Go find it. Um, let us know how you get on as well. You know, If you've got issues with this um, and you found a solution that works for you and you think uh, it's worth other people looking at, get a thread up on the forums and tell us about it in the, in the chat window on the podcast and we'll add it in our discussions but as always time is catching up with us so we need to leave it there for this week but if you have got questions 
And like I say, get them in the uh, the chat window on YouTube or in the comment section, or go to AV Forums. Go to the podcast forum, head down, find this episode, and leave your comments uh, in there, and we will get round to answering your questions and also taking on your ideas and your feedback in terms of what it is that you want to get from the AV Forums podcast, what you want us to discuss, who you'd like us to get on the podcast to discuss these things. And like uh, we've hinted at a few times and we will get there, um, we will have people from the industry come in as well and tell you how they actually do things and how you can replicate that in your own home. So uh, colorists and so on, um, that's all in the pipeline that will we will get round to that. And we also got uh, some special guest calibrators and stuff also coming in. We're going to talk about projectors uh, in May and how to calibrate projectors. It's still a dark art. Uh, see what I did there? Um, so, yeah, um, tune in for that uh, next month. We will be getting into depth with projectors and how to uh, get them calibrated and set up properly and the whole video chain and so on. So thanks again to Jules uh, for your input this week. Right, to wrap up, we just need to head over to Ed and get his vinyl album and playlist for this week. Yes, um, right, good news in terms of saving time. Album and vinyl is one and the same. Um, obviously, lots of people have heard of Brian Eno, because uh, he's one of the foremost ambient musicians in the last 40 years. Um, but Brian has a brother called Roger. Um, and I'm going to be contentious here. Over the last couple of years, Roger Eno has turned out better music than his more illustrious brother. So album of the podcast, album of the fortnight, is The Turning Year by Roger Eno. Uh, it's on all the major streaming services. Um, and unlike last last podcast effort, which was, you know, ballistic French, royal blood-esque sort of rock music, this is, it's gentle. It unfolds at low speed, um, but it is an outstanding piece of music. It is a beautiful recording and it is my vinyl release of the fortnight because the label it has been released on is Deutsche Grammophon and they do not mess around when it comes to mastering full stop, but the quality of their analog releases is utterly peerless. I've got this on order. I'm afraid I can't stick it up in front of the um, uh, the, the camera as I normally do because it hasn't turned up yet. It's one of those things. I was hoping it was going to show up today. It hasn't. Postman Pat will hopefully arrive presently and deliver it to my, to my sweat hands so that is both album and vinyl um i can't recommend it highly enough especially if you just want music to work to it just happens and it's it's extremely pleasant for that playlist is a bit more dynamic uh title this time around um i was drawn to it because it's the name of one of my favorite albums but it doesn't actually have any of that on it uh but it's called color of spring 2022 um and it the description of it i couldn't do it better myself let this playlist of recent favorite songs from around the world lead you away from the winter darkness into the bright and joyous days of spring and you know what it's a nice playlist 30 seven tracks two hours 17 minutes and 11 seconds so it doesn't overstay it's welcome it's a jolly good listen and there should be at least one or two tracks on there which have you jumping off and investigating the further work of the artist i uh, have indeed i've had it on uh, on repeat uh, today actually since you mm. put the the uh, the link up on the chat i've uh, yeah i've had it on a couple of tracks in there not too keen on uh but whenever well, no, that's but the nature of also... the curated playlist yep, isn't it exactly. very there, rare there's that a lot of all killer yeah but there's uh, there's a lot of tracks on there who I'm like, oh, that sounds nice. Let's find out a little bit more about this artist and if anything else that they do sounds just as good. So yeah, mm. uh, highly recommend that one and a lot of feel good uh, tracks. Yeah, it's it's, it's, well, it's, a, is, it's a cheery, optimistic yeah. playlist. You know, every now and again I do it once. You know, so it was it was I, I enjoyed it and I hope you guys do too. Okay, well, thanks uh, once again, Ed, for your input and. Uh, the upcoming podcast, so I did mention May, so we have a podcast coming up, and this is Hardware and Movies uh, on the 9th of May and on the 23rd of May. So uh, that's the podcasts that are coming up. Um, keep your eye on the homepage as well for the reviews that we've been talking about. Um, they will be coming up soon. Uh, keep an eye on the YouTube channel as well. Um, best way to do that is to subscribe and also hit the, uh, the bell for the notification. So remember to do that. My thanks to Ian, Jules, and Ed. And so. obviously, coming up yes. next is the Movies Podcast. Good evening and welcome to the Movies Podcast. And joining me today for this Cage Fest, I have Mark Costello. <laughs> evening all. And Simon Crust. Hello, good evening, and Nicholas Cage, spelt with a C or a K or both. 
Yeah, or both, yes, as we've recently <laughs> found out, yes. Um, so today we're going to be going full cage uh, in celebration of his massive talent. It's uh, massive. Gonna, it's massive. It's massive. 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 Yeah. Um, Doesn't fit on the screen. No. We're going we're gonna to be looking back at his best and worst films. Uh, and his recent very honest Ask Me Anything session and, uh, all, and also... Uh, giving all the latest film, TV, and 4K news that's not related to Nicolas Cage, uh, including early looks at Arrow's Wild Things and Candyman. <gasps> and also, I think what has just dropped today is uh, 12 Monkeys, but maybe, maybe. Oh, yeah. It has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, and Singing in the Rain, 4K. Nice uh, and strong arguments, strong arguments here, Mark, for why Peacemaker and Severance should be on your must-watch TV list for 2022. Robust, <laughs> they'll be robust, robust arguments. arguments. Kaz. Still yes. not persuade Healthy. You, no, uh, we were going to start <laughs> with a review of uh, unbearable weight of massive talent, but none of us have seen it, and Tom, unfortunately. Um, it was caught up with the unbearable weight of his own massive talent and uh, <laughs> is un- unable to give us a rundown. But according to him, it's just not very good and you shouldn't see it, basically. So like like most things Tom sees then. Yeah, four. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sol- <laughs> tr- trusty Tom four. <laughs> no, he uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, I think he he recommends it with the caveat that I think everyone would have probably wanted Cage to go a bit more full Cage. Um, but uh, but I think, um, I think I mean, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm not going to get out to the cinema to see it, but I'm undoubtedly going to love the fact that for some insane reason, it's been given a, a 4K release and a 4K steelbook release, which I've got on pre-order thanks to a... It, it's a massive talent. It deserves both of those. It doesn't make... The massive talent. It's zero sense. There's, a, you know, <laughs> House of Gucci, The Father, um, what, there's so many films recently that haven't had. Nightmare yeah. Alley. How many, of those, how many of those star Nicolas Cage? There's your answer. <sighs> Yes. Okay. Okay. We'll go with that. Um, before we do t- get too carried away with Cage, let's do some competitions. And our competition today is to win a Nicholas Cage movie. So um, you should hold fire for for that one later on. That's our podcast exclusive, winning a decent Cage movie. We didn't Absolutely. lump you with USS Indianapolis. Um, yeah, Mark, we would. Yeah, we would yeah, if we had yeah. it. If we had it, you'd be getting it. That's right. I did consider it. <laughs> did consider it. Mark, what have we got to win today? Oh, oh, it's so many, so many things, Kaz. Uh, you can win on regular but still glorious old Blu ray. Uh, Sing 2, my pick of April's Blu ray releases, The Days of Bagnold Summer on limited edition release, Young Rock Season 1, Constantine House of Mystery, Belfast, Dear Evan Hansen, and a couple of Studio Canal discs. But if you don't do 1080p anymore, if you are a 4K snob and only do 4K on disc, well, we've got your backs covered as well. Uh, you can win Scream. Uh, you can win a couple of second sight releases, including The Babadook and Spider-Man No Way Home on 4K. But that only has a couple of days left, kids. So get all over that. And if discs ain't yo bag, uh, we have a Fantastic Beasts merch pack for you as well. Uh, so head over to avforums.com forward slash competitions to enter. All competitions are open to eligible AV Forums members resident in the UK. Nice. And we have lots of winners. I'm going to run mm. through the winners because... I made my own snafu here, so I'm going to have to make my apologies. Um, Torian, I'm going to say Torian, even though it's T-4-U-R-E-4-N. No, that's so much snappier. (laughs) Say it like that. One Clifford, the big red dog on Blu-ray. I mean, Tom is going to be so so gutted he can't give that away. Yeah. Um, Brenda Ingram won Hidden Assets on DVD. Um, Lobster Hunter won the podcast exclusive The Ice Road on Blu-ray. Uh, Natalie Blythe won The Responder on Blu-ray. Paul Pierce won The Gentle Gunman on Blu-ray. Uh, J. Dore, 1964, won the podcast exclusive Spiral on Blu-ray. Patron Raz, 77, won Criterion's March titles on Blu-ray. 
Patron David M won Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City on 4K and Patron Lefty Lion won a discovery of which is the final chapter on Blu-ray. Now, Criterion's February titles, uh, I drew them and they've gone to Dapper Dan 486 Patron. Uh, he, he's probably got them by now. And then I got a message, a private message from Togasa, who's also a patron, who said, thank you for drawing me for Criterion's February titles. Uh, I'd uh, accidentally <laughs> clicked, I must have clicked um, the, the cycle round to the next person and then hit save. And it sent him an automatic message saying you got them. So uh, Togasa, I'm going to sort you out with uh, some spares from Criterion's February titles just to make you happy and but uh that's the power you have kaz you're 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 like a deity the power that you hold <laughs> it really in your that that one finger slip and look at that what the power to decide whether or not someone gets clifford the big red dog on Blu-ray is, hey is, hey that's... don't underestimate it okay okay i do i do a little bit <laughs> let's let's do cage then come on we've got a lot of cage to get age through. Uh, in celebration of Cage, I um, I put together a, a list. It's a it's a, a random Kaz made up list, but it splits Cage's entire life into a series of eras. I've got one. different ages of Cage. That's okay. what you should have gone with, Kaz. <laughs> it should, yeah. Different ages of Cage. I like that. Yeah, uh, there's six six ages of Cage. There we go. We've got early Cage. Action Cage, Serious Cage, Silly Cage, DTV Cage, and Cage Unleashed. Uh, they're roughly nice. chronological. There's a bit of overlap. And what's interesting about them is that two things I found. Firstly, there's at least one good movie in every era. And the eras are only like five, five years or so. Mm -hmm. so. So they're not huge eras. And his last cage unleashed era is seems to be by far the best of all of his eras um even though some of people's favorites will probably be for fairly early in the list but let's take a look let's dive in take cage. us through it okay. take us through it Cass. So early cage which is late 80s to mid 90s yeah uh, i i've put down rumblefish raising arizona wild at heart wings of the apache also known as firebirds red rock west and the pinnacle for him in that earlier era, leaving Las Vegas, which got him got him the Oscar, I think. Mm, it did, yes. 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 Got him so, a lot of recognition. Yes. Mm. So that was no, no Peggy Sue got married though. I I mean, I, I haven't included all of his films. He's done like five hundred films. So I could five hundred films. No, he hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't. I mean, <laughs> he could have done five hundred films. It's not uh, that much of an exaggeration. No, he could looking have at done, his uh, IMDb page, certainly in his DTV era. But no, yeah. I just I just picked like half a yeah. dozen from each era. But um, but yes, uh, yes. This, this is, is when he was a serious and wanted to be a contender as, as such, wasn't yeah, he? I mean, he wanted he, to be as, as a trying to get out well, of the shadow of the Coppola family. Yes, because I guess there's some nepotism there. There's, mm. there's got to be some, you know, starting off. Uh, I mean, how about you say that? But didn't he actually change his name from Coppola to Cage he, to he avoid did. nepotism? To avoid that. Yeah. So, you know, fair play. Sure. He, he did try and avoid it, but there's got to be some <laughs> some way in, doesn't there? <laughs> well, uh, do you know anyone who could maybe, <laughs> maybe oh. get me a... Oi, um, Uncle Francis. Yeah. <laughs> Got any work experience going this summer? <laughs> could, could have had a worse starting point for from an acting, but he did give his yeah. all. Absolutely. I, I think what's most interesting about early Cage is it was probably his most eclectic. He was he was all over the shop here. He, you know, I mean, Raising Arizona is one of is one of my favorite comedies of all time. Yeah. It's it's geez. And it, and he is a purely comedic creation in it. H.I., and, you know, it's, it, it, it's just a wonderful comedic performance. But then, like you say, you start off with Rumblefish. You've got your Wild at Heart as well, which is, which is you know, a really crazy... Well, obviously, it's, it's, it's Lynch, isn't it? So it's, it's a crazy concoction crazy. With, with dark humour, with, you know, insane intensity. You've got things like... I know you've not got it on the list, but Vampire's Kiss, where he's eating cockroaches for shits and giggles. You know, it's, he's all over the shop here. And I think it's because he's, you know, he's trying to find his, 
his got, niche. He's got Wings of the Apache, where he's trying to get some Top Gun glory in there. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So, so I, I, I think it's, I think it's a great period, but it, it's, it's for me, he is, he is, is finding himself in that. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it is. Well, we're, thing. we're finding him. I should say, yeah. he probably knew exactly what he was doing. Who he was? We're, we're sort of being introduced to the different ranges of Cage. Yes, yes. ranges of Cage, ranges ages of, of cage. cage. What's going on? What's your favourite Simon from that era? From, from that era. Yes. Uh, I I would have to say the uh, failed Superman film that never got made. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That would have really made it a colourful era. That would have really it? been something. Wouldn't did, it? Did, did they make a documentary about that? Kevin they Smith did. has been talking yeah. about this. I haven't seen. I would love to see that documentary. It exists. I've seen it. You can find, you find it on. Um, I'm not sure if you can get it on YouTube now. It used to be. Um, but oh. if you dive deep, 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 deep into the web, you can find it. Nice. nice, and it's it's incredible actually how far along they got um, mm. before it was actually cancelled. Um, quite incredible that you know I mean, that that suit was the, was the thing. But Cage was there, you know, and he and he. I don't know how would he have made a good decent Superman. No, it's difficult, isn't <laughs> it's, it? It's, it's, I mean, he would have no. given a, 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 a magnificent performance because he always does. But it wouldn't have quite have been the the the, the Clark Kent Superman yeah, that you would it, come to it to expect from. From the comics, it would have been it's just a little to bit. Tell. I think there have been tell. some choices. There yeah, have been some choices made. Hard to look back on now because I would say he closed out this era with. I mean, I I wrote it down that way, but he closed it out with leaving Las Vegas. Yeah, they gave him the Oscar. He he put in a tremendous performance. I wonder whether Nicolas Cage, after a few more of these eras, would have still stood a chance because he followed up leaving Las Vegas, winning the Oscar, with getting super ripped, getting a, a dirty white vest on, and doing Con Air. <laughs> I mean, it was an insane Growing choice that hair. for him. <laughs> yeah, if you, because if, if you remember Cage in his early films, I mean, even when he's doing kind of, in inverted commas, action in, in Wings of the Apache, I mean, he's a, he's a pretty skinny, slight guy. Mm. And uh, he is... He is uh, absolutely uh, i mean mm. he's he's properly properly ripped when he when he turns up for for conair and i think mm. um I, I don't know i th- i think it's i think it's interesting that he shifts so wildly to do that i mean they they spend a lot of time focusing on him being super muscly cage i mean it's <laughs> utter nonsense well, isn't it but it's well, 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 it is, but do you know what? And 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 bear with me on this. It's it's what Feige did with the MCU. You know, look what Bruckheimer did. You know, with with by picking Cage, who at that time was not an action yes. star, and he said, you know what? We've got these insane action films. We want a good actor because we're going to focus on in amongst all the stuff blown up. Yes, we want, we want that character, and so suddenly you pick Cage, and yes. you know, no Cage in those Bruckheimer films, you get no Downey Jr. in Iron Man. Yes. I am telling you, um, I think that I is see. that is the genius of what Bruckheimer did there by picking him, and and like I say, it could have been one and done, but no, and you know, and it kept going and it kept yeah. going, and there were more and more and more, yeah. and 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 that little oeuvre is is utterly spectacular. I think his action era is is. I mean, Tom has actually put in his favourites from each era. We we only just clocked it now, <laughs> but he picked Leaving Las Vegas from the early era. But from this era, he's inexplicably picked Con Air. I, I mean, I would, I can, I can understand that because it's it's crazy good fun. But the whole era is pretty intoxicating. I mean, mm. it's, it's Con Air. I put down Con Air, Face Off, Gone in 60 Seconds, Wind Talkers, and my choice was The Rock. Mm. And it was a tough call between that and Mark's choice, Face Off, mm. because, because it's a tremendous era of just action films. He does a, does a couple of woos. He does three Bruckheimers. I mean, he's, he's having a lot of fun out there. Absolutely. He is, but but again, and here's another hot take. It's not allow me to have a hot take. Hot take here. The best of those go, you know, starts to show, I think, where Cage is best. Cage works best with a partner. 
He works yes, best yes. with a double act. Yes, so I agree. C- Con Air, I'd argue that you don't go to Con Air for Nicolas Cage. He's there and he's great. You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, you go to Con Air for Steve Buscemi, John Malkovich, Danny yes. Trejo, yes. you know, hell, even John Cusack in that amazing suit. You, you know, <laughs> similarly, he is amazing in The Rock. I'd argue sticking with anyone other than Connery, and it is not the classic. The same yes. we face off. You sticking with anyone other than Travolta, and you know, half the fun in in face off. And I'll give you this: half the fun is is spotting the cracks where Travolta's Cage impression falls down, and where Cage's Travolta impression falls down, yes. and 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 eventually your mind just gives up because you you can't keep track of it all, and it's brilliant. But they were those the best ones for me there work when he is not the single sole focus. He is not the movie star tentpole lead of the film. And for me, that's something as you go through the later ages of cages, his best move, his best movies are where he is part of an ensemble or he is a supporting actor in it. So mm. that that that's, that's my view. Here. Mm. I like that. I like that theory. I would say I'm I'm gonna say that's part of the reason why I picked the rock over face off. I, I love, absolutely love Face Off. But if I'm picking a Nicolas Cage movie from this era, it, Nicolas Cage and The Rock, it, I mean, I, I, I re watched mm. it again in advance of this podcast. He has some crazy lines, <laughs> just normal lines that he, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's having sex with his girlfriend. He's in the middle of it. And he gets a phone call to go and stop some nerve agent. And he's, he's sitting there going, this is not happening. And then he's like, this is not happening. <laughs> and it's only Nicolas Cage. <laughs> only Nicolas Cage could, could make, that, make that work. It, it, you know, it, it, he's, it. He's, he's got all these terrible lines that you can tell from other, you know, Michael Bay movies. They, they, they clearly don't work in other people's mouths. But he, he's having a ball it's, talking about Fran, Francescan monks and creating champagne. Voila! You know, he's, he's just, <laughs> it's, his, it's his pronunciation of the word a hole. That's, <laughs> that's the one that where you go, oh, yes, he, he's serious now. He, he has such a ball in that that I had to yeah. give, give it to that as his performance but in face off which i love as well it's actually i actually love travolta mm. as cage so it's almost not as much a That's... nicolas cage movie for me because travolta doing his best impression of cage is one of travolta's best performances mm. You know, it's like because you're sitting there going, "Yeah, that's everything I love about Nicolas Cage yeah. right there." Yeah, it's great. I, I well, even even Gone in sixty seconds, which you know, I, I watched at the time and it was all disappointing because you know, again, part of the double act there it was him and Angelina Jolie, mm. uh, and and he was playing it far too straight. He was far, he. You could see he was trying to be much more Mr. Mainstream Action Man in that. But again, I I, I watched it a, a, a year ago. Uh, for the first time since seeing the cinema, and and there's just something so off about Cage in some of these that's just brilliant. Yes. That just and and it's the fact that he it's like the uncanny, isn't it? You know, people talk about the uncanny that thing which is ninety nine percent normal, but is one percent not quite right. Yeah. <laughs> that's Nicolas Cage in almost every film, but he's but it's brilliant, and it's that that he brings to it. Yes, he it's mm. he certainly does, and he he switched from that to serious. So he went. Mm. He went from he went from early Cage, which was a blend of everything, mm. to action Cage, proper ripped, and then he went to serious Cage. And for the serious list, we've got Eight Millimeter, Captain Corelli's Mandolin, Adaptation, Matchstick Men, Lord of War, World Trade Center, and Bringing Out the Dead, which was Tom Strong. Mm. What about Snake Eyes? Would you stick Snake Eyes because that's borderline silly oh, cage, isn't not, it? Why do I not have Snake Eyes in this mm. list? I'm gonna, I'm gonna put Snake Eyes in the oh, series list. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> nice live <laughs> adaptation. I am, I am, because Snake Eyes for me would probably top bringing out the dead. Mm. I have a lot of fun with Snake mm. Eyes. Mm. Yes, yeah, but, but yeah, but but even so, even so, I'd argue that, that there's not a film in there that sticks in the memory like some of his action stuff. They, they are. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't even like adaptation. I'll be honest. I'm not a fan of adaptation there. Out but... of the ones on here without mm. Snake Eyes, which I recently rewatched, which was great. Mm. Um, the one I most want another rewatch of is Matchstick Man. 
I think it's a small, mm. small little crime drama, but he plays it. Uh, it was him and Rockwell, wasn't it? It's really yeah. Scott, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He plays I, it proper wild within, I, I within the constraints again. of it. I think mm. of all of those, I think it's the unsung hero. Adaptation yeah. obviously got a loss of, of um, pundits and, and, you know, it's, I, think they, I think they liked it. But um, I, I think for me, the thing with adaptation is you almost got, it was too Charlie Kaufman rather than the, and it, yeah. and it was almost like cage met his match in, <laughs> in, in, in the, in the out there stakes. And it was just like, it was like, my mind couldn't compute what's going on. <laughs> Kaufman cage, cage cat. There's two Kaufmans, there's two cages. Oh my God. Yes, <laughs> kind I of thing. See, so you can see how playing against himself wasn't working for him. Uh, yeah. I might need to give that one another go, but yeah, certainly. I mean, you have to look at world trade center in there and, and you know, he, he was, he was, He's taken a different turn there. Worthier films, less fun films, mm. less fun cage. Boo. <laughs> are you gonna are you gonna make an argument for eight millimeter, Simon? No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so. Um oh. bring out the dead though, I reckon. Give it, Lord give of it okay. I, I haven't seen I haven't seen Bringing Out the Dead for oh a good while. I need to I need to give that another go. Yeah. Um, mm. I reckon Simon is going to be all over the silly cage. Uh, silly cage. Simon yeah. is a, sil- a silly cage advocate. Silly I cage. reckon because <laughs> it's got it's got his favourite film of all in there. Drive angry. Drive angry. That was three D, wasn't it? Yes, it oh. was three. I reread your review. You remember when we did all those three D discs? Yeah. I did. My Dri- God. <laughs> Drive angry had tires flying at your face. Yes. So silly cage was like late two thousands, early. Early 2010s, I think I, I stretched mm. the era, but you've got a couple of Ghost Riders in there. Mm-hmm. You've got a couple of National Treasures in there. I mean, he'd started doing sequels by this time. Uh, I put I, I put next to knowing together. Um, because, oh, oh, because no one's good cats. and one's not. But, yes, uh, but they're both these uh, premonition kind of mm. thingies. Yeah, and for a good long time. I got them confused, not because one wasn't much better than the other, but because for some reason Cage had done two premonition movies quite close together and given them one word titles. Uh, he also did Drive Angry, which was thoroughly mm. stupid. It but, was mental. I mean, I have to say, oh, it what wasn't. A, what a film. Yeah, it wasn't an unpleasant. Thoroughly really entertaining. Yeah, it's not, it was not, not a car crash. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say, watch that now in, in in these rarefied times. Who's who's the weirdo? Nick Cage or Amber Heard? Oh, you just okay. don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Yes. 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 Anyways, bit of polit- bit of bit of political left, the yes. kids. Bit of political. Uh, he he did he did also do Kick Ass. Um, yep. Which which brings me actually to his ask me anything, because because on his ask me anything they asked him um, who he was most inspired by in his portrayal of uh, Big Daddy was it Big yeah. Daddy mm, yeah, yeah, yeah the character yeah. and he he said it was uh, it was you know the classic Adam West Adam Batman West, yeah. and he said that he 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 said to Adam West. <laughs> He was channeling Adam West's Batman in this portrayal. And Adam West said to him, you were trying to. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I thought nice. was tremendous. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. It's actually, he did this, he did this Ask Me Anything. And I think it's changed. I mean, it's, a, it's been a whole immeasurable amount of good press for him. Mm. Because in an age when, you know, a lot of actors are assholes. Yeah. And they're being like public assholes, and they're thinking they're still going to get movies and not have their sequel to Bright cancelled. I mean, you know, it happens to a lot of big people. And Nicolas Cage turns up famously, he's very quiet on social, and he turns up and does this Ask Me Anything, and people send in messages. And he was really, really nice, you know, talking about. I think someone said to him he was once regarded as being one of the very few people, few actors who brought something different to the acting scene. And he turned it around and said, these are the five people who inspired me. So, so I appreciate what you're saying, but actually these are the people who brought something different to the scene. I just tried my best to learn from them. I mean, every question mm. that tried to, tried to show he might have a big ego 
he turned it around and showed he was actually mm. a really really nice but, guy yeah, but, but but again and i think i think the, the thing with cage is you see it all the way through he is he's never had an ego in any of his films you know mm. you, you you know all the way through, and i think that's possibly now why we're seeing i agree with you because i think his most interesting age is now might not be his best age but I like some of the stuff he is putting out in the, certainly in the last sort of five or six years. I think we're getting a higher hit. And I'm granted for a minute there, we thought it was going all Willis, didn't we? You know, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're coming uh, to DTV. Have, yeah. Ha, have film camera <laughs> will work for food kind of thing, especially with those <laughs> crazy stories about his insane spending. And he was dropping millions of pounds on buying a planet 20 galaxies away or some, some yep. stupid like that. But the thing is, and this was the difference, I think, you know, whatever the dreck he was in, he was always cage. He, he was, was always all, good. And he was yeah. always on. Whatever what, whatever version of on was needed, he was yeah. always on. Yeah. And I, and and he I think he, he, we're seeing it now. And the AMA, I think, I, I think I think confirmed it. He's he's just him and, and that eccentricity that comes through in his performances that we all really like. It's just him. And it's brilliant. And we yeah. like the fact that here's someone who can be eccentric and brilliantly eccentric, as opposed to the normal people who are eccentric and it's an affectation or they're uh, uh, eccentrically a dick. Yes. Yeah. You know? yes. And I, th and I think that, the, that often the case. Yes. yes. And I think that, that it, it's just nice to see that, that exactly like you said, he's coming out at this moment in time. It's all coming up roses for him. And it's brilliant because he deserves it. He's just, he does. Cause he's yeah. sat through. We're going to, I'm going to take you through the DTV era. <laughs> We're not going to talk about them because they're just bad. And I just listed some of the better ones. We got Dying of the Lights, which I watched in advance of this podcast. Don't anyone ever watch that? <laughs> uh, the Runner, Pay the Ghost, uh, Dog Eat Dog, Running with the Devil. Also watch that. Now, Dying of the Light is Schrader, by the way. Paul Schrader, like taxi driver Schrader. And Paul Schrader did The Hills. Come on. <laughs> okay. Well, it's it's The Hills Schrader. Uh, I, I watched Running with the Devil, which is Cage and Lawrence Fishman. Don't ever watch that. <laughs> Basically, skip all of these. I, I reviewed USS Indianapolis. Don't watch that. Just listen to Quint's story from Jaws again. Save mm -hmm. you a lot of time, and you get to watch a classic film. It's it's true, but you're missing two off the list there, Cas. Okay, aren't well, you? I come into the last two, which is Mark is going to defend Mum and Dad. Huh. As, as, as if it needs any so 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 we, we had that rash didn't we sort of starting in 2014 of you know horror films starring school kids you know and we we got cooties which was big fun with elijah ward uh from a uh, kids turning into zombies because they ate an infected chicken nugget nice uh it kind of culminated i think with lapita nyong going that little monsters thing which is quite funny because you got very small children around a very sweary australian which is just fun whichever way you look at it but then slap bang in the middle you had mom and dad which actually i think was absolutely brilliant because again cage and Selma Blair together, I thought were a fantastic little double act. The plot switch around where all parents had a sudden burning desire to kill their own children, but only their own children, I thought was brilliant. And, uh, you know, talk about DTV royalty. You got Nicolas Cage fighting Lance Henriksen. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the defence rests, my lord. It, it doesn't need anything more than that. It, honestly, it is an excellent film because again cage, uh, cage gets to go full gonzo in it because you know he's, he's he's chasing his own kids trying to throttle them you know in, in his in his bombed out man cave in his house and all of a sudden he starts having emotional angst about what he's doing and it, it's it, it's 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 cage on a page um, it's, where where, yeah. where am i pulling these from where am i pulling these from it's golden your mind golden so yes i <laughs> I, th I think i have uh, lodged a uh, very robust defensive moment I'm, I'm not gonna say for a second that joe is a better movie because it is joe but, is a better movie <laughs> <laughs> probably mum and dad is very entertaining but out of them probably actually maybe mm. a bit of both got him into the next era y yeah you know, I, I think joe, joe definitely. showed joe showed that he still had some acting chops and maybe mum mm. and dad still showed his wild side mm. is the next era i've called cage unleashed and in that we get mandy and we get 
colour out of space, which the two of them put together is mental enough. And then we get Pr- Prisoners of the Ghost Land, Willy's Wonderland, <laughs> Pig, and a, I mean, he cameoed in spite of us and was crazy in that. And then Unbearable mm. Weight of Massive Talent, where he gets to play all his best roles. I mean, it's a, been an insane ride, these mm. last few films. And it's mm. interesting to see we've reviewed the most out of these. I didn't actually put a We've actually reviewed all of his all of his films. Yeah, all of page that. unleashed mm. period. Mm. Um, it's 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 nice to see him go mad. I mean, not not everyone loves Mandy. It's it's great, but not everyone loves it. Not everyone got on board with Color Out of Space, and you can understand why. They're mm. they're proper kind of throwback eighties, but made now. Yeah, I, 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 but but again though, I'd argue that Mandy is. Lesser Nicolas Cage film than a oh he's the director of that the guy did Beyond the Black Rainbow ah, I can't remember uh, but 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 I you know I I don't think Cage was the real star of Mandy yes he got to go a bit Gonzo with a chainsaw at the end he got but, a, a massive you know, uh, but, but 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 and the same with Color Out of Space you go and watch Color Out of Space the film is nuts. It's not a Gonzo Cage performance. In no, it's his name. No, no, he's, he's so reining it in <laughs> <laughs> as, as, as much as he can. Yes. Uh, so, so, so again, so I, I, I think, and, and, and you know, I'll, I'll be fair. I haven't seen Prisons of the Ghostland yet uh, because I keep getting put off by some of the terrible reviews from you know tr- tr- trusted and learned critics who you know whose opinion Tom. is <laughs> well. A, a trusty Tom Four means it's a must-watch in my book, uh, but 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 again, I'm I'm, I'm liking that that now he seems to have settled in, and he's 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 been given the opportunities now to almost go back right to the very beginning with that eclectic genre mix, it's and he can crazy. he can do yeah. he can do, you know, a celebrity cameo in 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 a, in a massive big kids animation yeah. film. He can do the insane Japanese Gonzo slasher fest. Or he can do something a little bit more subdued, like like Pig, and 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 it's good to see him almost going full circle back back to where he started from, but with that weight of uh, massive talent coming to bear on everything. <laughs> like the oh, way you brought nice. that in there. It's interesting in his uh, in his AMA, he listed his personal favorite movies, and it showed a lot of self awareness because mm. he he said um, he said obviously Vegas. I think he said Vegas, Bring Out the Dead, and um, Pig. Pig, yeah, yeah. Which which is shows a massive self awareness across some of the terrible films he's done. I was going to say, let's be honest. If you pick if you pick the Wicker Man, we could pretty much adjust. Everyone would be <laughs> locked off then, wouldn't yeah. we? Didn't even know. make the list. Didn't <laughs> even make the list. The bees. bees, but yes, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's uh, I mean, it's an interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it with one last comment mm. and and. I appreciate this didn't show what a nice guy he was. Well, maybe it did, but it was the funniest question asked of him for me was someone asked him, good evening, Mr. Travolta. Uh, <laughs> said, how, how, how was, have you ever regretted swapping your face with Nicholas Cage <laughs> all over his back? And he just answered back with, a ha ha ha, and you could tell he thought it was very funny. I thought that was the best of all the questions. Uh, yes. uh, bravo, hey. bravo, internet, bravo, yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, right, we've talked a lot of cage. I mean, he there's a lot it. of cage to, to talk, I think. Uh, we, we could have we, we could have talked more if you were here, Tom. Tom we could have eaten uh, a peach for hours. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> we could have done. Uh, um, but we've got more to talk about. Mm. Serious stuff. Serious. Like what, Cass? Like what? 4K. 4K is a serious stuff. 4K is a, so um Simon has got arrows coming all out of him. I do. Right I've, been, I've been stuck with a lot of arrows. Um yeah. tish. Hey, for yeah. the past for the past <laughs> few days. Yes. Um I've got no particular order other than that I've only only just seen this one. This one dropped through mm. my uh, letterbox while I was at work, so I only saw it when I got home. 12 Monkeys. I'm presuming it was released today. It was, yes. yes. Okay, so um, it won't be up on site and probably until Wednesday at the earliest because I have not yet watched it. I've only seen the first half. Yeah. <clears throat> As you know, we like to watch everything thoroughly to make a, a full and just um, <laughs> 
by Wednesday uh, we'll find out. By, by Wednesday we'll find out. Yeah. With some kind of fault from Arrow. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. But but what I've seen so far, um, I'm I'm very impressed. I mean, I, I love the film. The the the, the mm. circular nature of the film is is simply wonderful. Um, and you can't really talk about the film without going into spoilers. So I don't really want to go into the film so much. Um, save it's a it's a good Bruce Willis. It's a very good Bruce Willis, it is, and it's yeah. an outstanding um, Brad Pitt as well. Mm. Um, I, I was talking to Nikki earlier. I was thinking, was it his first film, or was Thelma and Louise's first film? I can't remember which. Which I think oh, he, Thelma. Well, I think Thelma was first, but didn't he film this? No, it and it came out. I can't no. remember the order of it. No, that that's because like, I think he did. I think he even did True Romance before he did that one. Yeah. I thought they, so, they they only managed to get him because he was cheap at the time. It's before he was catapulted into yeah, being yeah, a superstar. Yeah, 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 and yeah, that's how yeah, they managed yeah. to get him. Mm. Um, and he does a spect- I mean, I've only just, um, as I said, I, I watched the asylum scene just about half, uh, 55 mm. minutes is when I stopped it. Um, and he's, he's absolutely outstanding in it. I, I'd mm, forgotten yes. just how nuanced and how clever he was mm. in, 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 the early, in his early career. Absolutely brilliant. Um, so yes, it's it's a it's a terrific film. Um, the the way everything ties together up nicely in a bow at the end, um, and all the seeds are there all the way through. Um, it's great. Nice. It's great. Um, the uh, the picture itself, what I've seen so far, is is quite nice. Um, I do. It says a brand new 4K restoration from the original uh, negative by Arrow, approved by director Terry Gilliam. Well, that's that's pretty cool. Um, and I would agree. Uh, it's it's really quite nice. Um, it, it still looks very nice and filmic, so it's got a nice lot of film grain on there. Um, it's mostly uh, well detailed. Um, I mean, Gilliam's filming style, as you know, is a little bit um, soft. Anyway, uh, he uses lots of fisheye lenses and, and spherical lenses and, and distance, that kind of thing. So it, it's reasonably soft, and it's but it's very, very intricate. And you can see everything in there. You can I haven't got to it yet, but you can probably see the, the hamster going round in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, it took about a month to film. It did. It did. <laughs> um, and and I, I will say as well that the hamster factor is actually on on the disc as well. Um, there's only there's only one disc in here. Um, it's actually in the machine at the moment, but there's only a 4K disc in here, mm. plus the, the the you know the booklet that you get with all the Arrow releases. Um, so what's everything's the, on the disc. What's the soundtrack on it, Sai? Because uh, right now the Arrow have started to sneak cheeky Atmos tracks in. They there. have. Just yes, to... I'll, I'll be coming on to that in a minute. On this one is is uh, DTS 5.1 and okay. uh, and a 2.0. Cool. Uh, the original. Um, both both of which have been uh, released before. Mm. There, there, there's nothing new there. Yeah. Um, the uh, I listened to the 5.1 and it was really quite good. Um, yeah, it's it's nothing new or yeah. you know, particularly outstanding, but but good. You know, very very serviceable, mm. um, reasonable base, good directionality. Yeah, I was I was quite impressed with it. So um, I'm I'm anticipating a fairly decent uh, score scoring for for this one. Mm. Um, although you know. People will have seen it before it goes up on site, no doubts, so just because of the, the way that it came to me. The I other think, two discs I have. I think maybe with Arrow's current... Uh, issues. Gonna, gonna, just yeah, say I guess, issues, Okay, Kaz. I was going to go with infamy, but I felt a bit harsh. But, but mm. issues, I think, I think there is probably a not unreasonable feeling of maybe waiting a, yes. a little bit of time before picking up these titles, whereas perhaps uh, the same people who would have previously pre-ordered them and who were yeah. out there pre-ordering Second Sight's Drive for 50 quid, maybe a hold fire, even on a 22 quid 12 Monkeys 4K, until they've read a few reviews just to make sure that yeah. you know, a scene isn't played twice or the HDR grading doesn't just disappear and half of the movie or you know some something doesn't happen which results in one of those mm-hmm. arrow twitter notices saying we it's been brought to our attention that our <laughs> you know our own qa team mm-hmm. haven't haven't noticed something yeah. and that we've had to be told by people buying the disc buying the disc something yeah. wrong with them yeah we're I mean, very sorry the t-boy had a hangover that day i mean it's yeah it's an unfortunate pattern that yeah. I can see why people might wait. So it may be that actually people will happily wait until after you. Maybe. Know the well, I mean, so far, 55 minutes in, um, it seems Pretty okay. Good. 
Excellent. It seems okay. Yeah, the, the it's Dolby Vision um, as well, so it's 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 pretty good. Um, fairly natural skin tones are good. Mm. Um, fairly bright, um, but natural. It's not you know overblown and pushed and oh my god, that's really HDR. Um, no, so I'm, I'm thus far I'm impressed. Shall good, we say. Nice. I like Excellent. it. Excellent, thank like you, Sai. That's all right. That can go over there. You've I've got, got two, two other discs though, which yeah. aren't out until the end of the month, end of next month, actually. Mm. Isn't it? I can't remember the exact date. Yeah, they're probably, both May. Probably the last week, isn't it? I think last I think week in May, both towards the end of May, yeah. Yeah, both towards the end of May. Um, one is Wild Things, and the other is... Candyman. Candyman. <laughs> but only say it once. Or <laughs> four times. <laughs> don't uh, it stop twice, after though. the fourth time. <laughs> yeah. So we've got to be careful. Candyman again. Oh, um, oh, hey, oh, oh, oh no. <laughs> oh, no. Um, so uh, let's let's talk a little bit about Wild Things. I've watched both of these. I've watched them both over the weekend um, to, for, for this podcast, really, and, and to get them written and, and uh, up on site. Um, Wild Things uh, has got both versions of the film on it. Um, it's a, uh, a new master, but it's been done by Sony, apparently, and not by Arrow, according to, the, uh, according to their web page, which is quite interesting. Mm. Um, uh, the film <laughs> itself, okay, so it starts off as, as a bit of a poorly acted 80s soap. <laughs> So, that way. Daily so, no. Soap. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I like what uh, you did there. <laughs> it's uh, wax on, wax off. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, yeah. It goes into a bit of a, you know, a bit of a, a sex comedy. Then it goes into a bit of a um, noir esque sexual drama. Then it goes a little bit off the rails. Then it just goes batshit crazy. You know, it's it just, amazing. It's just, it's, it's amazing. Just, it just gets worse and, worse and worse. It's like you're fishing and you're reeling in something. It's getting heavier and heavier and heavier. You think, oh, 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 it's a little fish. Oh, the fish has got bigger. Oh, the fish has got, oh, my God, it's a fucking whale. It's it's just absolutely mental. I mean, who the hell was going to put nerve in, in, in a blonde wig? I mean, that's just bonkers. <laughs> isn't it bonkers? Anyway. So, Simon, can you wear out a disc like you could wear out a tape? That's the question we all now want. That, now that, that's there a good question. Um, I, I've not worn mine out yet. <laughs> Only the, had it the, for a day. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the rewind button on my remote is, is starting to fall down. <laughs> yeah. It's caked in gunk, Si. What's this? <laughs> Seriously. Stop in love. Stop in love. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so we're all, buying wild, we're all buying wild things, wild things. excellent um, i can't i don't know whether i could ever rewatch it i don't know i mean I, don't, I have to say i know people say like showgirls has got hidden meanings and, and it's worth worth going over that again i've never i have actually rewatched showgirls i got i got no time for any kind of argument that it's a secret genius film and wild things is like like showgirls, except no one's making an argument that it's any good. Mm. It's, it's, so, it's, it's oh, not great. No, yeah, I know I, you yeah, are. I, I know you are, but it's... I'm a defender of the oppressed, Kaz. <laughs> sure. Social sure. justice warrior. No, it's no. The, the thing is with wild things. I, I think you came to it for all the infamy around all the sauciness, but I actually quite like the fact there is a proper twisty turny noir in there underneath all the discarded <laughs> bikini tops and soap suds granted but there is a proper film noir under there and i'm loving it is it really is i it, mean yeah. it just, i mean it goes off the rails i mean it properly does the only thing it? missing the only thing missing the only thing that would have made wild is, things better is it for sharp, Nic- did it? nicholas cage nicholas cage right. would have made nicholas better, cage yes. was in it it would have he, been a masterpiece but um, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely one of those conversations where you you want to bring up a Chris Hemsworth. Is it really mean? Yeah, right mean. Then? Yeah, <laughs> that's, is it though? That's you know, yeah. Is it though? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's the dislike, Simon? It's from Sony. So I mean, I'm guessing that's pretty good. Mm. we've lost simon it's it, so good it, it, he's got he's gone back to the disc right now he couldn't bear to be away from it any longer <laughs> he probably had that scene paused in the corner while he was while he was doing the potty he probably uh, did yes look 
Here he is. He's back um, again. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. Um, so, um, where are we up to? Can I talk about the picture or are we not interested? Yeah, yes, no, yes, we, yes. Yeah, that was what we asked. And then okay, you, okay, you asked about the disc. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> two versions of the film, both are from the, the, the cult from the same master. Um, details, very good, obviously. Nice, nice bit of skin texture. I thought I'd get that in there. Um, I felt that the, uh, again, Dolby Vision, mm. it seems to have been dialed up a little bit too high for my liking. Now, the film is very, very bright. It's always been quite a bright film. It's filmed in uh, Florida Keys, so it's extremely bright. It's hot and sunny, and it's meant to be. It's meant to be mm. hot and oppressive, and you get that. I'm not going to deny, but it just seems a little bit too bright, mm. you know? Um, conversely, when you look at some of the highlights, when you see um, uh, uh sunlight glinting off off of seawater for example i mean it's so bright it's it's it makes you blink and that's fantastic because you want that from an hcr don't you? You, you you want it to feel like my god that's such a bright sun but when you transpose that towards the sort of the the, the grass and the sun and the clothes that they wear it just seems a little bit too hot to me um mm. maybe me it may be fine, mm. but I, to, to my eyes, it just seems, you know, just to tweak it a little bit back a bit, you know, just tweak it a little <laughs> Recall. <laughs> Wait for the recall. Wow. This they is interesting. They cocked yeah. up the HDR grade, just right. like, what is it, Vinegar Syndrome did for Flesh for Frankenstein. Everything looked like they got a massive suntan. I mean, you, you think it's, like, it's hot. Oh. It is hot. You'd think even if Arrow make a few mistakes that Sony... Sony been pretty consistent. I can't mm. remember the last time uh, Sony stuck I mean, out. Maybe, maybe, maybe it is just that that's the choice that they made. You know, yeah, yes. it could be. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's a William Friedkin and deciding that the French Connection looks better if everyone was blue. Maybe it's that candidate. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Oh well. What about what about Candyman? Candyman, awesome, absolutely awesome. One of the best horror films ever made. One of it's the best the, interpretations the one, of, of all it? time, <laughs> and it's awesome. Um, I reviewed this on site 2018, was it, when it yep. first came out? Something like that. Mm, yep. 18, some, mid, mid, the, something like that. I can't remember exactly when. Arrow, double disc, dil, D- double, double disc, yeah. yeah, they, yeah they, with, a, a, a late release. They, they stuck on the, uh, the, the UK, un, un, what they call the unrated cut, which was the actual the, the UK release. Um, mm. Right at the last knockings, they just threw that in. Um, fantastic to have that. Um, and this release, um, I mean, they say it's a brand new 4K release from the original camera negative, um, uh, supervised by director and DOP. I think it's the same master. Yeah. I don't see they would have done it again. No, no, no. Um, I think that's what they've done for all of them. All, all yeah. it's had is, is, a, is an HDR, um, Dolby Vision grade. Mm-hmm. And that is brilliant that's really well done mm, all right. um you get some um you know all that all that luminous graffiti in in the ghetto that i mean that comes out really well there's certain scenes when when the two girls are walking along and the sun's going down he does a lot in that sort of that magic hour mm. doesn't he um bernard bernard rose and when he, he films a lot in that magic hour yeah. and, and you can see the sunlight coming through and it looks it looks like you do right now mark actually it looks that like really <laughs> glowy, orangey very Tasty. very nice hill <laughs> <laughs> really very nice um, um, black is fantastic. White is awesome, actually. The, and the flash is there. When, when she's taking the pictures with her flash mm. camera, flashing on the screen, it's really good. Blood is sickly and awful. Oh, it's, it's, I'm, I'm super impressed. Oh. Very, very good grain structure. Um, and the, uh, the unrated, the UK cut, the UK theatrical cut, is as good as the R-rated cut. So they, they, it's, mm. the, both films are on there by seamless branching so that the, the few i don't know was it 10 15 seconds difference between the two there is a slight dip but it's much much better than it was on the blu-ray so they've obviously Excellent. done something to it rather than just bash it you know mm. throw it into the into the case yeah um i'm trying to think if there's any new extras on it oh no 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 think... what's the atmos like sites oh, the, the atmos. atmos there is That's an atmos track. one yeah. <laughs> it's you know what it's pretty good it's pretty good. The nice. opening of it, that that um, uh, Phil Glass's score when it's coming oh, through with a heavy bass and yeah. the chorus, mm. and that is all that's all going on. And then Tony Todd's voice comes in. Oh, yeah. it's like the voice of God. It's nice. everywhere. 
Ah, oh, it's really good. And the, you know, the crashing of the funeral pyre at the end when it's all collapsing, that's really good. Yeah, so, it's, it's impressive. It's impressive. <laughs> I'll have um, three, please, Arrow. Yeah, <laughs> the, I mean, the, the question of do you is is it worth per mm. right from bloody hell, four years yeah. ago now? Um, I think I would say, yes, it's worth it. Um, okay. You get the two films now on the one disc. You get everything together. Whether or not you're going to pay the extra money for the, the you know, the, the extra bells, which is the tap version, which is the one that is coming out, or you wait another month or two for the for the the bare bones, um, that's you know up to you. But I mean, it's 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 a worthy upgrade. Detail wise, is not much in it, but the the HDR grade, the Dolby Vision on it, it makes it a different film. It's really good. Mm. I'm super impressed. Nice. Brilliant. Excellent. Wow. Cheers, I. Eh? I think Arrow have done done us reasonably proud. Yeah. I think that's a that it could have been could have been a, yeah it could have been worse it could have been like Henry <laughs> there could have been some recalls yes uh, yeah, none yeah, none yeah. so far <laughs> but, but tell us about singing in the rain on 4K uh, did, did it have you singing in the rain it had me singing with my heart's a flutter uh, no it, I mean it was it's lovely so, so like so I got this today I'm I'm halfway through it but. It's everything you'd expect a golden age MGM full technical production to look like. Never it's, seen it's, it. It's you've never seen. I've never seen. You know, the most oh. I've seen of it is I've watched Leon like twenty times. Oh. Oh, right. So I feel yeah. like I've seen it, and I want to see it because nope. it's Leon's it's, favorite film. It's. But... <laughs> I mean, the beauty of the film itself is it. It, it does not feel like those other classic golden age Hollywood musicals, because it is not a period piece. It is a very modern, it is about the history of cinema. So it's got the element of being self-aware. It, it's poking fun at self-important celebrities, which let's face it is, is still fun 70 years <laughs> later. Uh, and to top it all off, you've got that absolutely brilliant combination of taking, you know, what Gene Kelly did with for the the technical dance moves of your Fred and Ginger, but throwing in uh, comedy, physical pratfalling comedy routines, the the likes of which you know from Keaton and Chaplin, where you've got Don O'Connor and stuff like that, and that beautiful sort of amalgamation of of all of that means it it's you watch it and you're just smiling. You know, I mean, I haven't even got to singing in the rain yet, but yeah. it's just oh, it's just it, it's just a, a it's just a beautiful brilliant big hog of a film and it always will be and it's brilliant so get it watch cats uh okay. into in terms of the, the the picture quality on it yeah it's very nice it's it's very nice indeed the opening scene is at a, a film premiere outside you know sort of grandma's chinese theater so you've got lots of matte paintings and so you know and anything i i oh it's looking a bit soft and suddenly you get that first cut to the announcer decked up to the heel she's got pearls on everything and the detail on it is absolutely immense it's it it is it it's proper jaw dropping uh you've got some lovely h so it's hdr 10 there's no dolby vision on the disc but that's okay for for me rocking you know a very poor jvc projector which might not be good enough for you know film reviews here on the site uh but it, <laughs> it but it looks it looks absolutely wonderful the only slight problem so far is the shooting style that that don and kelly had is they used lots of long takes going into lots of optical fades and transitions which means you know when the film sort of softens a generation when you get that switch you've actually got long periods of where the film is noticeably softer as it goes into the fade uh so it's just and again there's nothing you can do about it that's just part of the, the photochemical process but it is the the consistency between that tip top prime level of detail and the slightly second grade because of the optical work it's more noticeable and there's, there's more of those changes so far in it but but other than that this is a mm, it's a top tier uh visual presentation audio wise you've got the 5.1 that was released but you've also got the original uh mono track in there in lossless uh dolby digital which is good so you've got the choice and this needs the 5.1 just because i want to expand it out a bit and it, it's nice it it literally just takes it and spreads it across the front array so you've got no forced you know ambience from the from the rear speakers you've got no ridiculous new awful foley effects it's a very nice tasteful remix so 
uh, yeah, so far, very, very uh, impressed with it. And Kaz, I'm going to send you my old version of it because I feel bad that you haven't seen this. All that, right. All right. In, in some countries, that's a crime. I know. I know. I really, considering Leon is, is in my top three movies of all time, I feel like it. What, it probably, what would he say? Yeah, I know. You, you're disappointing Leon. He, he, would, he would be unimpressed, yes. Terrible. Yes, he would. Very nice, very nice 4K today, which has actually put us almost out of time for streaming news. So I'm going to run through the streaming news really quickly and then we're going to hear about what we've actually been watching. Um, we were going to talk really quickly about Netflix and mm. Netflix getting some bad news and everyone ragging on Netflix. And I mean, I think it was perhaps a bit blown out of proportion. They did the right thing by cutting off um, Russia and uh and they lost a bunch of subscribers as a result of that um but this has also been expanded out to show that how they didn't meet their quarter expectations and you know everyone's looking at what that means and will they be able to pick it up and is this the end of netflix uh and then everyone's looking at you know what's coming up in may and it's like well there's nothing there to save netflix i mean Really, it's a little bit short notice to to be looking at just what they've turned around. I don't think anyone could have mm. predicted this turn of events, and it's a, it's a pretty good May. I mean, I, I think it's a great May. Yeah, they got they got Stranger I, Things, which yep. which is one of their strongest like tentpole mm-hmm. features and has been for a long time. I think a lot of people will be looking forward to it. They yep. do spend an awful lot of money on it. I I read. Today, thirty-five million an episode. Is that what, what it that, was? That doesn't Total make the any sense. on the kids. That doesn't make <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. But that's the only explanation, Simon. <laughs> 30, thirty-five million. I mean, every episode is like a mid-tier Nicolas Cage movie. <laughs> With, without Nicolas Cage. Without Nicolas. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me. But I do enjoy it. I'm not mm. sure I enjoy it. Thirty-five million an episode. Enjoy it. I think. I think maybe that's. That's quite a lot. But anyway, there's that. Uh, yeah. Love, Death and Robots, Volume uh, 3. Love that. Out. Yes. Love right. that. I do have a, a lot of time for that. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. What I'm not looking forward to, which I should have been looking forward to, is the latest Ghost in the Shell. I love Ghost in the Shell. Mm. I love all things Ghost in the Shell until Netflix came along and released Ghost in the Shell 2045, which is, I mean, it, it should have all the ingredients I like, but the animation's kind of this new cg 3d thingy Mm -hmm. it doesn't look like classic ghost in the shell and the story isn't you know that clash between Mm -hmm. what's a machine and what's a soul and it's not kind it's more more let's go and blow some stuff up um which is fine but it feels Mm -hmm. like it's missing something they're coming in for a second season so it'd be interesting to see if they turn it around Mm -hmm. i mean they've got all the ingredients and they got the money but they might be playing yeah. for a different audience, but that's what I got down. But Mark, you have spotted mm. something you're looking forward to. Yes. So I, actually, I, I think it's it's a pretty good month for movies on Netflix. Uh, I mean, they've got the premiere and I think Doctor Sleep, which I have a lot of time for. Shining yes. fans, give it a mm-hmm. go if you haven't. Mm-hmm. Uh, which version? All, Is it director's? Uh, I, 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 It'll be, I, the director's it'll be the director's cut, cut. which is a shame. But, shame. You know, I mean, well, you, can get, but you used to be able to get both on Prime. Didn't you? I'm sure you did. Mm, the director's have... cut is better. Yes, Sleep. but you have to you have to buy it. There were separate cuts. Mm. But, but anyway, uh, yes. So 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 that's good. Uh, I'm also a big fan of uh, the Hairspray remake. I know, shoot me. But again, <laughs> it's back back to Travolta. But the one thing that I do want to draw people's attention to, if they've missed it, is a little film called Spontaneous. Now you may look at it and go. What is this? What teen angsty comedy rubbish is this, Costello? Well, let me tell you, it is a. What did I? What did I write? I'm going to read Blood this. Blood spattering, <laughs> et riffing, teen angsty romance, emo dramatastic. Yeah, there thing. you go. Yeah, so so it's pretty good. It's basically <laughs> about high school kids who spontaneously combust. Uh, they ah, ma- sold. They they, they, <laughs> they managed to turn it, for, it. It starts off as amusing as that sounds, yeah. but then it goes quite dark, and it does actually get quite emotional. And I mean, it, end, it ends pretty up, dark. <laughs> well, it's well, well dark. yeah. <laughs> but 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 like like I said, the midpoint. There's a brilliant. They 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 take the piss out of ET something rotten in in a sort of uh, hospital scene, and it's just it, it made my 
old soul just saucy now but no it, it is really good fun uh if you get chance to check it out i do recommend spontaneous on netflix it's good fun okay okay yes and what have we been watching simon uh scrubs <laughs> wow and, and i finished severance as well nice nice, nice. Go on, get it out, get it out of your systems. I'm just gonna go. I'm just gonna go and just listen to something over here. You're gonna listen to Sparks. I am. <laughs> no, look. I mean, it took a took a while for us to convince Tom to watch Peacemaker, but all four of us have watched Peacemaker. I mean, I appreciate hmm. he's only halfway through the season, but he'll get that. Oh yeah, he was sold. Yeah, but it took a while to persuade him. We've all watched and loved Peacemaker. Yes. I think the fact that three out of four of us have watched, and I'm assuming here, Simon, loved Severance. Oh, ah, dissenting argument. Bravo. Bravo, Mr. Crust. Bravo. There wasn't the final episode, some of the tensest TV you've watched in a long time. Yes, it was. But like all of these new TV shows, it doesn't wrap anything up. It's just a big tease for the next season. It is, yes. Well, it wasn't actually the last episode. It, they took the last episode and they stuck it on to season two. <laughs> so I think... Okay. Well, that would make it's more possible, sense. It's possible that the last episode would have been a bit more satisfying. Yeah. But as soon as they knew they were getting another season, they pulled they it off the pulled end. Pulled it off and... Stuck it on. at the yeah. beginning of the other, like oh. they did with Titans and a bunch of other things. And so the last episode is just one fat cliffhanger. Yeah. Off the back of a hell of an adrenaline ride of like six different stories all coming together. But um, it, it, can you, so you're not going to sell it to Mark. You're going to give him an argument. Um, like, I, 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 hang on. I watched the first half of the first episode of Seven. <laughs> that doesn't count as bored. No. I, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm not a fan of this. Oh, you've got to waste three hours of your life before it gets remotely good. No, I don't. Three, three episodes. It's what I said to Tom about Peacemaker. Ah, no, Peacemaker was great minutes. after three minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sure, but not was, maybe not maybe not for everybody. I don't know. Oh, it's I don't know. Did you see that opening gambit? I mean, exactly. I opening mean, credits. So opening credits. Yeah, it was. But I didn't want Tom to give up after three minutes, yeah. just in case. So I sold him on three episodes. I think you should try three episodes. You might find that the sci-fi kind of twinge to it kicks in after a bit. It doesn't happen after the first few minutes. It's a, Fine. a longer burn it, than that. I, it, 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 it's a it very it long burn. Okay. It, it takes it is a, a long very long time, time to oh, get no, it going. No, 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 I'm is, out again. Which is a bit of a shame. I don't think it needed to. The, the, I can the, see the, the idea is quite good, but it's not yeah. a new idea by any means. You know, the, the nefarious company that may be doing something good, maybe doing something bad, we don't really know. We never really find out. I bet they're doing something bad. So, no, no, that's, I'm just yeah, going to throw that out there. Actually, what I think what got me was the actual concept, which hasn't been done before. So I agree with you about the company and all the rest of the backdrop, but the actual concept is what. What, mucking about with memories? Yeah, I've never seen and, that before. Yeah, but I know, but the way they've done it actually makes you think. It's quite, it is quite clever. It, it all does, right, make, it all does right. make you think, well, you know, what would I. What, what would you do I mean, in that? You know, is situation. it better? Is it better than Hugh Jackman's reminiscence? Yes. Well, all right, I'll give it a go then. Yes. I mean, I mean, honestly, it's probably the reason Tom isn't here today because <laughs> during his <laughs> during his working day, he agreed to do the podcast, <laughs> and then he flipped over in the evening and completely forgot we had the conversation. <laughs> so this is where we're at. Um, tell nice. us about Sparks, Mark. Uh, yes. So uh, I've gone all musical this month with netflix uh there's a lot in there but on the weekend i watched edgar wright's documentary the sparks brothers which i've been wanting to see and it dropped on netflix a couple of weeks ago i think and it's absolutely brilliant uh, because i know nothing about sparks other than of course this town ain't big enough for the both of us and the fact that hitler's playing keyboards in a artastic band from the 70s uh (laughs) but it was it was it was a fantastic documentary uh edgar wright put it together as only edgar wright could but it was just amazing seeing so much footage of this band. You know, the, we were talking about the ages of Cage. You could talk about the ages of Sparks. You know, you, <laughs> you just don't realise how popular they were. And then they disappeared to nothing. And now they're back again and, and all this. And it's just, it's just a really, if you like your music documentaries, I am not a, a huge, like I said, I'm not a huge Sparks fan at all. 
but I want to go and check out their music after watch this documentary. So that's good. And the other thing that I've been watching on Netflix are the remastered series. These are short one hour documentaries looking at music icons from across the ages. And the two that I've watched recently were about the, uh, the killing of Sam Cooke and the shooting of Bob Marley. And they're, oh, they're, just, they're, they're, they're just fantastic <laughs> little, well, you, again, you say that, but they're fantastic little, they're an hour each. And, you know, what they are doing is they are shining a light on aspects of these these characters, which you didn't know anything about, like the Bob, yes. the Bob, the Bob Marley one, you know, how politically involved he was, how entwined with Jamaica's politics and the country he was and how he left Jamaica, was forced to leave Jamaica because of this assassination attempt that may or may not have been. Uh, the doing of one of the political parties over you know it's 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 it's, yeah. it's a fantastic little hour-long drop into a a piece of history that you didn't know anything about and so yeah i can't recommend these remastered a uh, little documentaries enough on netflix they're brilliant okay okay good all right i'll watch some of those you watch seven all right done 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 um right let's close it off with the podcast competition which is at lee to win a copy of Nicolas Cage's Pig on Blu-ray, which I think is a, <laughs> is, is a, a well worthy worth prize. Biffing, Absolutely. Yes. Biffing prize. So if you want to figure out which your best answer is for this, you have to answer this question, which no one else has access to but people listening. Who plays the lead in Nicolas Cage's Pig? It's a really hard question. I'm, I mean, I didn't even know. I didn't even know pigs had names. I mean, that's just really difficult, Kaz. <laughs> it's really tough. So yes, yes. But, so there you go. Um, so yeah, that's it. Bring that's it on it. home, Kaz. Wonderful. Bring that it is, on home. That is it. That's it for the AV Forums podcast <laughs> this week. My thanks to both the hardware and movie teams, but mostly to to Mark and Simon <laughs> for actually turning up. Unlike Tom, you know, thanks, Slacker. Tom. Thanks, yeah. Tom, if you even remember us. Um, <laughs> if you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a like and subscribe to the channel, plus hit the notification bell so you don't miss out when we publish our live streams, product reviews, and more. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook and bookmark avforums.com for the latest reviews, news, and videos. Plus, why not leave us a five-star rating on whichever service you use, if they allow it, but only if you enjoyed the show. Tom won't. Tom will give us a four out of ten. He might, do. he might do four out of five hopefully <laughs> you won't notice it's out of five <laughs> i'm cass harlow thank you for watching and listening and join us for the next podcast on i believe the 9th of may thank you wonderful cheers folks.